guys welcome and welcome back to the podcast i've been meaning to watch that i am your host monica and we're back again with new week new topic new guests like we do every single week and this week is very very special because we're diving into one of my favorite shows that i don't get a chance to talk about a lot on this podcast because it's a very long running show and not many people have watched it but for some reason everybody knows what the show is about but I have got what I believe to be an expert, although he would not call himself one. I think he is one. Uh, he has an awesome YouTube channel that I've been following for a while now. And he talks about Doctor Who, you know, and he breaks um, certain things down about different seasons, different arcs, different writers on Doctor Who, different characters. And if you're looking for your one-stop shop on everything New Who, I would highly suggest that you subscribe to our guest, Harbo Harbo Wolms is here today. Hello. <laughs> I said that right, right? Yeah, there okay. you go. <laughs> Great. Harbo, or is it okay if I call you Harvey when we're recording? Cause yeah, cool. Okay. Harbo Harvey, Ether works fine, you know? <laughs> awesome. Okay. Cause I remember when you emailed me and I saw the name and I was like, that is a, such a normal name, but I don't think that's the person I reached out to. And then I looked through my like spreadsheet and I was like, oh, wait, that's the Doctor Who guy. Okay, my bad. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, for a long time, people thought my actual name was Harbo. <laughs> 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 like they thought that was, you know, my parents thought, yeah, let's yes. call this child Harbo. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. It's definitely not that. No, it's not. And we're so happy to have you on. I'm so excited because we're going to be talking about Doctor Who and Star Wars. You know, our thoughts and what we think will be the future of both these franchises. As they have both now are owned by Disney. And yeah. there have been a oh. lot of change-ups. Well, Doctor Who isn't exactly owned by Disney. It's being It's a complicated, owned. yeah. It's like yes. a co-production thing at the moment. And yeah. Yeah, it's fun when things get so complicated in terms of like streamings and like TV shows. It's like, oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love to see it. Yes. But before we dive into that, we're going to start our first segment, which is Media Mania, where we talk about new releases and entertainment news. And the first thing that we wanted to cover was the new Amazon Prime show, Fallout, which is based off the very popular video game starring Ella Purnell. And it's gotten very, very popular and a lot of really great reviews since the release, right? Yeah, no. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm a big fan of like the Fallout games. So obviously I was I was in the camp of like, oh no, I'm kind of not not sure about an adaptation or a show or something. So when I saw a trade, I was like, okay, it looks I'm kind of it looks a little bit. I kind of built myself up to be like, okay, now I can, <laughs> I can safely enjoy this. Once I heard good things were coming out about it, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's a really good tra like translation of the the Bethesda era of the games. Obviously, there's there's a hardcore fan base for fallout one and two and tactics mm -hmm. like and then it moved to bethesda and they changed it to a completely different style of game so this is obviously more like the later stuff and i just think yeah that the aesthetic wise it just matches so well to the the games and just even the narrative like it follows the same structure as uh, a lot of the games where it's like you know you have this fault dweller something happens they have to go out into the the wasteland and then you know they, they come across their first major settlement and it's just the same things happen in kind of the way it would in a game which i think is a really good way of translating because it's it's different to something like the last of us where i actually took the exact story yeah and like this is just a new story but they're telling it in the same way you'd expect from a game which i think is really good yeah, it's good that you mentioned The Last of Us because I feel like in the past, a lot of video game um, adaptations have been movies. So they're trying to like take the world that the video game already exists in and create a story within it, but not exactly like the story of the game. Yeah, and, then, and it's like... the kind of thing people have always asked for because you've, you've always had these, these movies and stuff. They've tried to do just the exact story of the game. It's like, no, it, it doesn't work because you need the interactive element or like you get the characters wrong. Obviously with Fallout, it's just everything's new, but they still have obviously the iconic elements and stuff like the Brotherhood of Steel, which are a big part of the games and stuff. And yeah, it's like, as far as I, I've only watched three episodes so far, so I don't know if they've brought any like characters from the game universe into the show, but I don't think they have. And I think that's the right call, especially for season one, because mm -hmm. you want to start it off as like, beginner friendly as possible yeah and i think that um because 
when the show was announced, I was really excited for it because Fallout was a show that I would always see other people playing. And I was always interested in like the gameplay and the characters. And I've been kind of like following it to now the release. And yeah. it seems like everything has been done so meticulously and with a lot of care, which is what you want from any adaptation, yeah. especially video games, because like people put a lot of like heart into video games and making them yeah and then the players they spend so much time in this world that the first thing that people think of if they play a game and it's getting adapted is like this better not be trash like this yeah. cannot suck <laughs> and i think from what people have talked about with like ella Purnell, um kyle mclaughlin and goggins a lot of people have been saying they've done a really good job like making yeah the show. It, it it just get, it gets the perfect like tone and genre. Right? That there's a lot of of really good comedy in there. Like obviously when you, when you're trying to introduce comedy into something that Fallout, it's a very satirical kind of game. It, it, a lot of it is sat, like satirizing the whole Americana aesthetic and everything like that, and nuclear war. And it, it it's kind of there are lots of comedic elements in the games. Like um, I think in Fallout Four, there's a quest line where you just find like a kid ghoul in a fridge just randomly right and he's yeah. just there in a fridge yeah <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> and and i think that's another thing the fallout show does well is um at least in in the fir first three episodes i've seen that they even out i reference how in the games most of the time you just end up doing random stuff on the side you just get sidetracked so easily and that happens in like episode three you know that one of the characters it just says like yeah you know one of the rules of the wasteland you just get sidetracked <laughs> <laughs> you just go off and do something completely different and right. it's just yeah it's a fun way of keeping the the identity of the sh like the show and the game so close together yeah i i completely agree with that and i feel like i love the way that when i first saw the trailer it just looks like fallout like fallout is very like yeah post-apocalyptic like punk kind of it's not exactly like steampunk it's, it's like it's got a unique aesthetic really yeah yes and that's the thing that's really cool about fallout because like there are video games that too tend to come out that like look very similar to each mm. other you know like a lot of people say like they can't tell the difference between like call of duty and like other like fps yeah. games but like fallout has has its own kind of like look and feel to it and it's created this own storyline and to have a show that accompanies it and does it like pretty well is really like great to see especially because like yeah there's no way it's going to be bad because it's amazon prime and they like put a lot of pride into like their shows and they don't want to like put out a bad mm. product you know what i mean not exactly like the the halo show that <laughs> is infamous for being very bad yeah very unattached from the property and completely just ruining the characters and everything and it's it, i think because of the halo show people were a lot worried about fallout being like oh no it could go that direction right. but thankfully it hasn't and it's very much got the identity of the games and yeah it's it's a really good show at least from what i've seen so far mm -hmm. and that's what you want really like like i said before in any adaptation but really like the one thing that will always piss me off is when i see a trailer and i'm like oh this looks really interesting. This looks really good. And then you watch the show or the movie that the trailer is of, and it's like, wow, that was a waste of my time. That was actually awful. <laughs> I actually like. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> the worst they they put all the best bits into the trailer. Yep. <laughs> but, but no, with, with Fallout, I think it's actually the opposite. Some of the best bits I hadn't even seen in the trailer. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I was like, oh, wow, I wish that would be in the trailer to get me more hyped. But right. yeah. I, it's one of those weird things where it's like, I try not to watch trailers of stuff that I know I'm going to watch. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think I watched the first trailer of Fallout and I was just like, okay, well, I know I'm going to watch this. There's no need for me to watch the others. It's like uh, with House of the Dragon as well, because yeah. that's gearing up for season two coming mm -hmm. out in a couple of months, I think. And that is, I know I'm already going to watch it, so I'm not going to bother watching any trailers because then I feel like you, you're sitting there and you go, well, I remember this bit from a trailer and that character was in that scene. So I know they're going to be fine in this moment of peril that they're in. So that's why I just try and detach myself from trailers because then I know that it's like there's something back in my head because I no because I know they're going to be fine because I saw them in that little bit in a, in a trailer. So. Right, that I feel that sentiment so deeply because a lot of times trailers 
especially for movies, people like spoil mm. the movie in the trailer, or they put all yeah. the good bits of the movie in the trailer, and that's very frustrating. Because yeah, sometimes I don't, I want to go into a movie blind just to like kind of just watch it and experience it. But if it's something like you said, um, House of the Dragon, or mm. if it's something like for me, Challengers, or like Fallout, or like just anything that's coming out soon, like I guess this is vampire movie coming out called Abigail. Um, the girl is like a ballerina vampire and there are these right. like, this ragtag group of criminals that have to like survive the night in her house um i will watch the trailer for that because i want to see yeah. i want to like you know get an idea of what the film's about and also because like i'm excited and i want to sneak peek but if it does something where it like puts all the good stuff in the trailer or like puts a whole movie in the trailer then it's like <laughs> okay next time i'm just going to go in blind i'm just going to let myself yeah go hungry because it's not worth it at this point like yeah you guys are ruining a good thing for me <laughs> and that's very disappointing definitely yeah one trailer that i actually didn't watch because i'm trying to avoid not avoid but i'm trying to yeah. go in completely blind is for season 14 of doctor who um because we're talking about doctor who today i have avoided all trailers because there's been a lot of news coming out about the new season of Doctor Who. Yeah. Because Yuchichi Gatwa is a new doctor and a lot of people are excited and also like holding their breath in anticipation for like what's going to happen. I'm sorry, my mom just walked in. That's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. New Who, New Who. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I've been avoiding a lot of trailers in regards to the newest season. Because yeah. anytime I look at a trailer or read any news, I'm just kind of confused because I have to try and keep, like, I have to try and keep track of everything that's coming out. Like, recently, yeah. I saw an article that said there's going to be two companions. And in my head, I'm like, oh, that's weird. I thought there was only going to be the one girl. And then you let me know that the two companions are for next season, not yeah. this season. Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky thing. Like like we were talking, uh, talking before we, yeah. we start recording, it's like, they're, they're filming the furthest ahead they've ever really done so a lot of the time that they have to announce these things because otherwise people will see it in public when they're filming or something like that so they they have to go just get ahead of the story almost and be like okay this is what's going on otherwise the moment they start filming out in public you'll get a million people with cameras like because it, it happens every series so much stuff we find out just from people who are watching the filming because you know they like they like to film out in public for a lot of the the episodes yeah problem is with that there's actual people, people in the there. public yes <laughs> who can just stumble upon this film set and be like oh look okay there's that main like big main character right. making a return or showing up so a lot of the time they just have to just be get ahead of it and say okay the this is going to be the cost for parts of next season or whatever <laughs> so just that then they, they cover themselves and they own it in a way so yeah. it's a tricky thing there's always some sort of news coming out and then like i said kind of the, the way i always have to be plugged in because it's my, my job to make videos about doc Shoe, i know all sorts that has been leaked and stuff and it's one of those weird things where it's like sometimes i've got to remind myself of like what, what's been leaked to like the, the people who are really plugged in and then what's actually been officially confirmed and stuff because it's like i know things that i can't say because they're obviously spoilers because they haven't been officially confirmed so it's it's this weird constant guessing game of what's real what's spoiler what's like a fake spoiler or it's just a mess in a good way i guess so i definitely see what you're saying about that and i feel like because so many things come out all the time about like doctor who it just like leaves fans not only confused but they're trying to like piece together like what's happening you know when there are so many changes coming out about like your yeah. show that you've seen for so long they want to understand like what's the path we're taking what's the destination and yeah. really that's like what we're going to talk about today is like the path of doctor who and i wanted to ask you like a little bit about your background with doctor who like what first got you into the show and like how long have you been like watching it and like what got you i guess inspired to make your youtube channel yeah okay so like i guess first of all i watched it because my my parents uh, mainly my mom grew up with it mm -hmm. uh it's kind of a, a lot of thing 
uh, mainly obviously British people, they'll mainly often watch Doctor Who because yeah. their parent or someone in their family has watched it and introduced right. it to them. Uh, I was in the unique position of when the show kind of came back in 2005, I was like the perfect, I was about six years old around that time. Oh. So I was the perfect demographic. So I, I was watching it from like the beginning, mm-hmm. quote unquote, um, from that just every week and grow. So it's been part of my life for basically my whole life at this point. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah, it's been about uh, 20 years out of my almost 25 years of, of life. So it's, it's kind of just something that's always been there. And I, I would say it's definitely my, my favorite show or franchise or something just because of how many stories you can tell in it and just how endless it is. And it just, it's constantly ongoing. And I think, yeah, there's, there's been at least one episode every year since 2005. I, I don't think they've missed an actual full year because even in years where they didn't have a series, there was like a Christmas special or something like that. So it's one of those things where it's, it's ever present in, in your life when you, when you follow it. And that, that's quite fun. Um, in terms of like making videos about it, I kind of just, so I, I, I kind of dropped out of the show a little bit around series 10, kind of just wasn't really vibing with it or anything like that. And then when series 11 was coming out, obviously they had this big push, this whole things are going to be so different and everything like that. And I kind of thought, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give this a go. I'm kind of excited for it. And then it kind of coincided with a time where, I'd, I'd finished school and I kind of wanted to go into media production or like editing or anything. So I just thought, oh, I'll just make a couple of video essays just to practice. And then, yeah, it just took off and then really took off around the time COVID hit because obviously everyone was shut inside. Yeah. So I had a captive audience and yeah, it just kind of became my, my full-time job. So it's, it's, it's a weird one because it's like, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to make Doctor YouTube videos. It's just like, well, I like Doctor Who. I'm rewatching it. I'm rediscovering my love for it. I'm just going to make a couple of videos about it. And yeah, I just never really stopped. <laughs> right. Okay. That's awesome. I mean, I feel like that's perfect because you just kind of like fell into it. Yeah. And it's already something that you like and you already are, have such an interest in it that it was yeah. just so, it was kind of like something easier to just like talk about really definitely like, discuss and cover yeah yeah i know that you've talked about like other things on your channel like stranger things and you've covered like other topics but like i started watching your videos because um season 12 was coming out i believe it was season 12 and it was jody whitaker's second season yeah okay and basically <laughs> i was trying to really like root for season series 11 because i've watched doctor who since i was in middle school so i was like 14 and i right. got into it because of tumblr because there was this thing called super who luck oh <laughs> god <laughs> yes inside as one of those fans <laughs> yeah yes very much so very much so I had a super who luck blog and it was something that i really really loved and enjoyed and i stopped watching i actually stopped watching i don't remember what episode it was but i think it was the episode when amy pond was having a baby in space right and she was like talking to the baby in her mind and i was just kind of like i don't know if i like this anymore (laughs) and i stopped i also was just like after um uh i believe it was tenet left and then it was matt smith and he did like the whole custard and fish fingers thing with baby amy i was watching this and i was like this feels like he's doing too much like this guy does not have the flawless charisma that david Tennant has yeah and he looks like a neanderthal i don't know if i trust him <laughs> so <laughs> i got back into the show because jody whitaker was like named the doctor and i was like well i can't just start watching this new season without knowing what happened previously and yeah I caught up and then after Jodie Whittaker's first season came out, I was just kind of like, I kept seeing like all the criticisms about it. And I was like, "Mm, I need like a better season or I need someone Mm. to explain to me what's going on because I feel like I see it, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know. And so I started watching your videos and I was like, this is very helpful. (laughs) Like, this is great, (laughs) a great resource. Yeah. Because it's kind of funny because it was around the end of Series 12 that my videos really took off. Uh, I did like a a big review of Series 12 and then like a a video essay, which I'm I'm not really keen on the video essay I did about like the, the, there was a big time as child reveal when obviously a lot of people were very passionate and disliking that. And yeah, I, I just made a video about it and that just blew up. 
Yeah. And so a lot of people kind of hopped on board around that time because it was very, it was common for most people to be making negative videos about the show around that time. Right. And I guess I, I just fell into that, even though I wasn't making many videos about the current show. I was kind of doing retrospective reviews to kind of from, from the beginning up to like the, the present. And right. yeah, because it, it's one of those weird shows where it's like, obviously, there are parts where sometimes you have to watch from like the beginning to get all the context, yeah. but you can really just often throw someone in at just a random episode and they'll get the general idea of it and pick things up. And, and I think that's a good thing about the, the new series that they're doing is they're trying to treat it a bit like a fresh start mm -hmm. to get people back. And obviously if they came in and said it's series 14, a lot of the new people were like, Oh, do I have to watch the th previous 13 series where right? you, you don't have to like I, I think like to get the most out of it you should but they're treating it yeah like a, a new start and I, I i respect that in certain ways although i'm not a huge fan in other ways yeah. but <laughs> i i feel the same way because um i don't like this is gonna be like i this is very particular of me and i know this might make me sound like a butt face i don't know but I don't like it when people are like, oh, you can just watch it whatever order you want to. Because <laughs> I know that people aren't going to watch like 13 seasons of a show mm. just to watch the new season. So it makes yeah. sense to start the new season that people will tune into as like a fresh start. Yeah. But as someone who's been here since like a while and has seen like Eccleston to now Gatwa, it's like, well, I kind of want you to be tuned into like what's going on. Because if you keep Googling like, yeah. oh, what is are you my mommy? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't want to explain that to you. I kind of just want yeah. you to know, like when you ask, what are we think angels? It's like, I don't know, the most obvious thing in the Doctor Who fandom besides the Daleks, like. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where it's like, um, when, when I was introducing my girlfriend to Doctor Who, I just started with series one. Yeah. And you know, th this was, this was probably about, what was it? Late 2021, start of 2022. So, you know, it's quite far along. I could have just, thrown her in with series 11 but i thought no 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 i want to show her from series one just to get everything just to cover everything because then like you said you can't going back it's like oh who's this character who's returned who's this who's that and it's just a lot of baggage mm -hmm. but i i think that's something they're trying to avoid with series 14 slash season one as it's being and being branded because yeah otherwise you get a lot of people going like well what's all this homework i need to do right yeah that's true, but I think that I don't want to, like, okay, I'm just going to say it. I feel like the new start with, like, Michi T's season is a disservice to, like, fans that are, like, excited for the new mm. Doctor. Because if you're, they're obviously trying to, like, pander towards, like, newer fans and bringing in, like, new people. Because Michi T, a lot of people know him from Sex Education yeah. and now Barbie. So there are a lot of people who watch him and are familiar with him, but not Doctor Who. So they'll want to watch the new season of Doctor Who and they'll want to be able to watch it without having to do the homework. But you have a larger fan base of people who have been watching Doctor Who for a long time. And if you try to do the fresh start like they did with Jodie Whittaker, you're going to end up with a, se a season like Sears 11, which was in all niceness, kind of subpar. <laughs> like it pretty good episodes pretty good writing chris chibnall is not untalented by any means mm. but you can very clearly say that like if someone was watching doctor who like just watching it normal like watching it like a binge and they had no idea about like the news of like joy yeah and Nichiti Gatwa, and they're just watching the show like normally there is a very strange shift from you seeing Peter Capaldi having to deal with Billy Potts turn into a Cyberman to now <laughs> Jody Whittaker on a train climbing yeah. up like some electrical towers and then her now having four companions and now suddenly Rosa Parks is here even <laughs> though nothing wrong with Rosa Parks nothing wrong with Rosa Parks this is a British show though like it's an American story and like I know like there are probably a lot of people in Britain who know the story of Rosa Parks yeah but, like it feels like there is a strange shift and if you keep trying to like break up the flow of the show and the story and like what you're trying to like tell then i don't feel like it's going to help you know what i mean yeah what do you i think? mean it, it's probably one of the biggest like double-edged swords of yeah. doctor because obviously every couple of series 
lots of stuff changes. They get new writers in, they mm. get new lead actors in. And, you know, a lot of the time you, you do have slightly different changes. Like um, the first Rusty Davis era, obviously, Chris Eccleston and David Tennant, it was a lot uh, very earth based, a lot of uh, personal drama, kind of family dynamic stuff. And then you go to the Moffat era with Matt Smith, and a lot of it is it kind of fairy tale led. So it was a lot more uh, science fantasy kind of stories and stuff. But it's always a tricky thing. You've got to try and maintain the flow. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, keep keep some elements like a, a writer or two, or, you know, the, the first 10 series of the modern era had a lot of the same writers and a lot of the same production people and like the same composer and everything. So it, it largely felt like the same, but then with series 11, they tried to just change everything. Mm -hmm. they, they got a new composer, a new like style of filming and stuff. And, and it, it's a decent idea. It's just obviously such a, a harsh shift can be alienating to a lot of people. So, but, but I think what they're trying to do with this new series is they're trying to avoid that. Obviously mm -hmm. that they've got, uh, an old showrunner back, well, you know, the, the most popular. To, I know there's a lot of fans of Moffat, but in terms of just the, the mainstream kind mm -hmm. of casual audiences, yeah. that like Davis was the most popular showrunner. So he's back. Uh, Moffat is back to write an episode. So you've at least got that. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're trying here and there to keep things familiar while moving it forward. It's just, I think it's one of those where I think it's the next season that's the biggest indicator of how well they're going to stick with that or how well it's going to achieve those results. Right. And then there's also the fact that they're already filming season 15. So if season 14 doesn't do well and you still have the same showrunner and writers, then season 15 may just be the same vein. So then you... Yeah, because it is one of those things is they're, they're very heavily aiming towards the American audience because of Disney Plus. Like, yeah. um, obviously, Disney Plus gets it at like the same time as i play but it's the favorable slot for americans where it's like 7 p.m in america whereas over here in uk it's midnight release mm -hmm. which i know it's like a common thing to do these days but where it's a show that has been aired on you know traditional tv for its entire history it feels weird to be like okay well now you've got to watch it at midnight if you want to watch it when it first airs it's, it's like there's just this weird thing of it it feels like they're pushing towards a more American audience, especially with parts of uh, the new series. Like there's a Beatles episode mm -hmm. and it's like, OK, of course, the, the first Disney Plus series, the immediate because, you know, what what do Americans know about Britain? The Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> it's just immediately that. And then it's, oh, we have got another historical episode. It's in the Regency era because of Bridgerton. Right. It's oh, that's another thing <laughs> like Americans see the uk as so yeah. it's just this weird thing if it's like the most american perspective mm -hmm. of what doctor who would be where it's like oh yeah we're gonna go see the beatles we're gonna go to bridgerton and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff so it's just this, this weird tone where it's like trying to aim towards the american audience and it could work out well but it does obviously it worries a lot of hardcore fans as to whether it's gonna swing entirely towards being for an american audience mm -hmm. where obviously for 60 years it's being built up as this predominantly like European audience. So it's like, okay, you gotta try and get a, a nice balance between the two right. rather than just going one or the other. Yeah. And I do you think that it's hilarious that they were doing the Beatles episode for Doctor Who because Doctor Who usually doesn't do like pop? I don't know. Like they don't usually do episodes where it's like, oh, this is like a funny like little meta episode where it's like, oh look at um, this. Like I feel like but there's been a few insta like obviously yeah. uh, it's not even going to be the beatles first appearance in doctor who they appeared in uh, a first doctor story where obviously that was airing at the time the beatles were actually a big thing oh, and yeah. um they they tune that they, obviously they're in like the future so they tune into a a past broadcast of the beatles performing which actually is the only surviving clip now of that beatles performance because it had been wiped afterwards so doctor who is the only reason that that clip survives wow. but anyway um it yeah they've, they've done obviously there's a, a specific genre in doctor who called the celebrity historical mm -hmm. where they'll go back in time they'll meet some notable historical figure like uh, vincent van gogh or oh, yeah, winston yeah. churchill right. or agatha christie and kind of just have 
a little bit of a fun run around romp with them. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's what they're returning to with the Beatles. But it is funny that it's like the, the first one of this new era. And it's the one the, the one thing Americans think the most about, about... like famous British people. Yes. It's, yes, the Beatles. Of course, it has to be. <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference between like the Beatles and like Vincent Van Gogh because his episode yeah. will obviously be a stark contrast to what we're going to assume the Beatles episode will be. Yeah. And I feel like, like you said, with like different writers and different showrunners um, taking over the show, it reminds me of the show called The Office. Have you seen The Office? I haven't seen it. Obviously, okay. I've heard of it a lot. And obviously, I know that there's the UK version and the and American the version movie. and that yes. people always debate <laughs> as to which one's better. And yeah. obviously, the UK people will say the UK one's better and the Americans will say the American version's better. Right. But yeah, that's all I really know about it. Yeah. At, at least like for me i know the american version and around the time i don't remember which season it was but like there was a time where there's a lead actor his name is steve carell and i believe yeah. he was playing like ricky gervais's character in the uk version yeah yeah and at some point he left the show so then without having like your titular character who pulls the show together it, you have to like kind of adjust and have mm. like someone else kind of step onto the plate and it was very hard because like the writers were used to centering the show around Steve Carell's character yeah. and his own personal conflicts. So without him there, they now have to like shift dynamics to like some of the side characters, which the audience is not used to. And hmm. some people enjoyed it, but a lot of people didn't like it that much. And yeah. I feel like that does tend to happen sometimes like with, um, like you said, the Russell T Davis uh, era with Eccleston and David Tennant, hmm. there is obviously a huge, there's a different dynamic between like Steve Moffat's era and i think that the i guess like the creators of doctor who they believe that bringing russell t davis back will somehow like repair what happened with chris chibnall's era and it's, it's a tricky one because yeah. for, from some reports and indications it was basically a case of if russell t davis didn't come back mm -hmm. no one would like the show would have just probably just ended at that point or just disappeared for a couple of years because it sounded like because chris chibnall was like when when he was writing the 13th doctor's last story mm -hmm. he didn't even know if there was if it was gonna keep going after that like uh -huh. because i yeah there's all sorts of speculative reasons and mm -hmm. supposedly official confirmations and stuff but it's just this there was a lot of uncertainty around it so davis obviously wanted to come back but also he knew that he kind of had to because that was the only way it would survive mm -hmm. so it's just this weird thing of now trying to make it future proofed for that when he leaves again because i a lot of thing people mention is like oh this especially me it's like it gives this idea that doctor who can't survive without russell t davis mm -hmm. so it's just always a worry because obviously moffat came along and he did well he had about seven years in terms of show which is about twice the runtime of a lot of shows entirely mm -hmm. but it's just about because the show is constantly going and constantly evolving you need to make sure each new showrunner can at least match the last if not surpass them mm -hmm. so it's just this constant game of now it's like the, the show didn't perform to a lot of people's expectations under the chibnall era mm -hmm. so then they were put in this awkward position of either you know rest the show outright or kind of do this Hail Mary of bring back the what we know works and try to go from there. Right. So I I definitely see that. Um that's very interesting because I actually didn't see that many news about it and I understand why they would want Doctor Who to keep going because it is kind of like an institution at mm. this point. And definitely. There could be like worries that if you take a break with Doctor Who or you stop making the show yeah. There's no indication of when it will really come back. So I can understand having like a seasoned writer and showrunner mm. back on the show. But I want to say like it never hurts to bring on new writers. Yeah. And I know that Chris Chibnall has written on Doctor Who before, so he's not exactly new. But he's fairly new to like being a showrunner of this kind of show. Because before he did yeah, Broadchurch, well, and now no, he was like... Well, before Broadchurch, he was head writer of the Doctor Who spin-off Torchwood for oh, series one and two. Yeah. yeah, so he got he got experience with that, and that's I think uh, I'm actually working on a video kind of right now about kind of that touches upon that. Spin-offs can work as a 
kind of building block or right. like pipeline towards show running the entire thing mm -hmm. like you know i know chimnall's era wasn't hugely successful necessarily mm -hmm. but it does show that someone can start off writing for like get their experience on the lower stakes of a spin-off yeah and then kind of build their way up to the main show and it kind of creates a nicer ecosystem for the show because there's a lot of talk about spin-offs and how many spin-offs there be and what's spin-offs might happen gave us once mm -hmm. a very marvel kind of disney star was approach to lots of interconnected shows and everything which could it could go very badly if not handled right yeah I mean, it could also go very well if it's handled right it's a kind of a big risk that's true and when you were talking it actually reminded me of star wars the like sequel series of star yeah. wars where the force awakens was like a really great movie pretty solid start mm. to the whole mm. um sequel okay i like the force awakens <laughs> <laughs> i enjoyed the force awakens and i feel like it was a pretty good building block but then you have the last jedi it was with ryan johnson and that was a pretty different it was a different it was really different from like the force awakens because the first awakens you have poe you have finn and you have ray the three of them and you're all focusing on their stories as the trio but mm. in uh the last jedi instead i'm pretty sure it's the last jedi yeah the last jedi you're focusing mainly on ray and her story which is fine nonetheless but instead finn and poe are kind of like sidelined yeah and although you're interested introducing new characters it's definitely a break from what people are used to in a star wars movie mm. and it's good to change it up and try something different but if you do something so different then like your other characters are stilted and like their story yeah. has no progression then in turn that hurts the story and in turn that hurts like what you're trying to build and what kind of story you're trying to tell to the audience yeah. because in the same way that the prequels may not have been everyone's favorite at least it was a cohesive story that everyone understood and you could see how darth vader came to be and mm. as the originals you can see um leia luke and han han, han? yeah yeah <laughs> han solo and you see their story progress but in the third one because there was you know the one writer who wanted to create something different and new for a star wars movie we have this strange shift so then when the rise of skywalker comes out you have to kind of remedy it in a way where it's like let's get back to star wars but the remedy wasn't enough like it wasn't really like enough to put well, it together rise of skywalker is the worst <laughs> worst of the bunch that is such a mess of somehow, a movie how palpatine has survived <laughs> Yeah, somehow Palpatine has returned. And he's here, I guess. He's just, yeah, if, if you watch the Fortnite exclusive event, you'll know how. <laughs> no. Oh, God. It's just, it's so hard to watch this happen because, like, a lot of times it seems like, it seems like creators are trying to, like, fall prey to what they're being told from outside sources instead of focusing on like building a story yeah. and building like something that is cohesive and something that people can follow along with because if there's someone who just randomly starts watching that star wars sequel series and they see force awakens like oh that's cool i think that that uh finn guy might become a jedi that's really awesome i've never seen that happen and then you see uh the last jedi and he's like okay so he's racing giant gerbils yeah in space with his friend and then the female Jedi is like in love with the guy who's supposed to be like Darth Vader. Hmm. Okay. Let's wait it out. And then you see the third one. It's like, wow, that was, that was ass. I don't like utterly ass, you know, which fits with what we're talking about with Star Wars because you, they have all these spinoffs now with Star yeah. Wars that. I don't want to. I don't want to say they're doing well because I don't feel like they are. Like besides Andor, yeah. Andor's really good. Oh, yeah, Andor is like the golden child. Oh, it's yeah. it's kind of funny. It's like anytime I'm like, oh, I need to think of a show that's a good example of just anything. It's like, oh yeah, Andor. Yeah, Andor. <laughs> it's like the only thing I ever like reference or, right. or com compare to anything. But it's because it is a genuinely good show. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of part part of that is that they went into it not trying to tell a star wars story mm. they tried to because i i went to star wars celebration last year 
and I went to like the I think it was like the designing and or like panel where it had um oh, I've forgotten who the lead writer and is on that but yeah it had like a panel of like the lead writer and some of the cast members and stuff and they were talking about um kind of what well, we yeah, have designing and writing the show yeah. and it was interesting how I oh, was was it Tony Tony, is it Tony Gilroy? I think his name is. I it think is I think that's his name. Yeah. Yeah. He would he would always say things like rather than saying like a speeder tri- a, a speeder bike chase, he'd say oh the motorbike chase, and it just it flips that switch in your head. It's like okay, well that's how he's seeing the show. He's seeing it as like like a, a Jason Bourne style show where you got motorbike chases and you get all these things, and he's not thinking about oh yeah it's that that t50 speeder or something it's got thinking about all this in from a star wars lens it's kind of right in the show as it would be like a normal everyday spy thriller and then it kind of gets transplanted onto the star wars universe with all like the the things we know and like the the aliens and the stormtroopers and everything and it makes it work so much better than going hey we want to make a show about ahsoka or hey we want to make a show about obi-wan kenobi right and then it's like Okay, what do we do? <laughs> you know, they go, okay, we want to make this show about a spy for the rebel that goes like this. Like, okay, well, we have a character ready for that. Okay, we'll just put him in there mm-hmm. rather than going, yeah, it's like, okay, well, how can we excuse Obi Wan Kenobi running around having adventures when he should be sitting in exile on a planet aging 50 years and 20? Right. You know, <laughs> it's like one of those things where a lot of the spin offs, it just feels like they're they're making a show for the sake of it being a Star Wars show mm-hmm. rather than trying to just make a genuinely good show on mm-hmm. its own merit. Yeah. I do agree with you because I feel it feels like they're very reliant on nostalgia. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so something that this point, because I was really excited for the, the Acolyte that mm-hmm. it sounded like something very different. It sounded a lot like Andorra. It's like, okay, they're telling this story. It's like probably going to be like a political thriller with you know, intrigue and scheming between like the Jedi and this mysterious acolyte. Mm-hmm. And then the trailer comes out and it's a bunch of people in pristine cosplay robes running around the woods with lightsabers. And it looks like a fan film. It's like, seriously, that that's what this show is. We, yeah. we were being hinted at all these amazing, interesting things. And it just comes out and it looks like the most generic possible Star Wars spinoff that any fan ever would write on like a fan fiction site. Mm-hmm. And it's just some of those things. It's just like, okay, that show might have been hit by the same spin-off curse that all the other shows have. Yeah, I think that there's just this weird thing with Disney where they have like, I don't know. I feel like the strategy behind the spin-offs is that they're relying on fans to have content brain. Yeah. Where they just want you to see that like, oh, this is Star Wars. Look at these characters, you know, look at these things that you remember from childhood. Like, come watch this show and just like, yeah, just watch it, not actually like take it in and like think about it in any kind of exactly. way. And then you watch a show where people are dying, but people are getting hit, but no one actually dies. Yeah. You know? And you're just kind of like, OK, so if no one can die in this show, then what are the stakes? Like, why yeah. are they going I- on these adventures if there's no fear that they could like literally die like what yeah there's nothing here that i need to like worry about truly it's and just... yeah and a lot of things like with the obi-wan show is you know that they, they try and introduce these characters to this like here's this new person you're gonna love them and care about them and it's like mm. i don't and then it's like oh they're dead you must be so upset and it's like no i don't i'm not really bothered no <laughs> <It's just> like... <laughs> not upset at all actually don't care actually they could have exactly. not been in there wouldn't have changed anything <laughs> and yeah it's like again to to say how Andor is really good because mm-hmm. it does things so organically, you know, every like, cause it, each episode was like a little mini arc. So it was like every three episodes would be its own kind of storyline and a setting. And you know, you have the, the initial escape from the planet he's on. Mm-hmm. So you, you have, you have characters there you care about, and then he escapes from there. And then he goes on this rebel mission. Right. You have characters there that you end up caring about because they spend time with them. They build them properly. They actually feel like real people. And then, you know, there's the prison arc and obviously Andy Serkis' character, everyone loves and he has this amazing story. And it's just this, again, the thing, if it's not written for, hey, this is glup shito to reuse the meme, that, that, that you know, isn't it great that they're back? Mm-hmm. It's just, hey, this is a character that could be in any show in like a good way. And now they're in this universe and you're attached to them and, oh no, that they've died or something bad has happened to them. And then you're actually upset about it because you've grown to care about this character. They've given you actual good writing and characterization. And yeah. 
Yeah, I 100% agree with you on Andor, and I actually loved Andor so much that I still like think about that show, and it's something that I've actually been recommending to my friends to watch because. I feel like a lot of people don't want to watch the Star Wars spinoffs because they feel like they have to do homework and, are, and yeah. don't understand it. And the great thing about Andor is that you don't really have to know who Cassian is. You exactly. Just, you just need to have Disney Plus, really. Or yeah. just be willing it, it, to like sail the high it, seas. Yeah, it, it gives you all the context you need within the show itself. Right. So it, even if you don't know about Rogue One or anything about the Empire or something, it gives right. you enough to understand exactly what's going on. You know, anything else is like flavor text or like extra reading you can do mm -hmm. you know if star wars didn't exist at all and this show existed on its own it would still work it would still perfectly work you know there's no thing of being like oh you need you need to go watch this show to understand what happens between season one and season two it's like right. no you can actually just completely follow the story mm -hmm. and then obviously since it's a prequel series you don't even need to then watch rogue one afterwards mm -hmm. like obviously it caps off and or story but you don't need it because you can just assume that okay well, the, the the show's over now. They've had their quote unquote happy ending. Everything sorted. Like even if they haven't de defeated the evil empire, they have ways of their small victories. And because it's just a basic narrative at the mm -hmm. end of the day, it's just an oppressed hero rises to fight against the oppressors. It's a very easy to tell story, and they don't overcomplicate it mm -hmm. with all these surprise returns and cameos and jingling keys in front of you to go be like hey here's this random obscure character from one clone wars animated episode isn't it great he's back <laughs> yeah it's better when they do focus on the story rather than just like trying to bring in like notable characters and i feel like that's one thing that i kind of felt i don't know annoyed by in season two of mandalorian when mm. luke skywalker just kind of shows up yeah because in my mind i'm kind of like well it's great that he's here but he doesn't necessarily need to like be here in the yeah. show and then like there was also talk of him being in season three of the mandalorian which i watched a bit of but it was so long ago that i actually like don't remember that much of it but it's so, the the thing i really hate yeah. about mandalorian is oh. how you have season one obviously perfectly fine serviceable yeah. enough some episodes not as great as others season two obviously a lot more misses uh, weird stuff going on jingling keys approaches not as great mm -hmm. and then at the end they have one of the literal main characters go off mm -hmm. and you're like okay i guess baby yoda grogu's gone now he's gone off to train with Vic skywalker you would think and then you watch season three and it's like oh he's back right. because it turns out you have to watch a spin-off of the spin-off uh -huh. to then find out what happens in that gap mm -hmm. to then see him reunite with the, like din Djarin, the mandalorian yeah. and come back and suddenly things are all different and it's yeah. just like why do you have to then go and watch a completely different show yeah when that context should be within the mandalorian itself mm -hmm. and a lot of people have kind of speculated that that probably wasn't originally going to be the case it was going to be in season three but then like plans changed and had to kind of awkwardly crowbar it in but it's that kind of problem with these spin-off cinematic universe things mm -hmm. where you don't get the full experience by just watching a show like this is like again if andor at the end of season two suddenly you have all this crazy stuff happening in a completely different show mm. and then you come into season two and you're expected to know that suddenly and that's a problem with the approach of having these interconnected spin-offs because it just leaves no level of co actual cohesion because mm. you have to make a checklist like okay well i've watched this show now okay now i need to watch this one Mm -hmm. okay and i have to watch now, now this in that order i have to watch like two episodes of this show and then two episodes of that show and then two episodes of the first show again to all jigsaw together and it's just a mess and it's just not a sustainable business practice no it's not especially when like you said people don't watch the spinoff because the only reason why i watched book of boba fett was because i was told that you have to watch it before mandalorian season three and i watched exactly. it and i liked it for what it was i think that like the actors in the the show did very very well but when they introduced grogu and they reunited him back <laughs> with mando i was like oh okay yeah. i don't know why boba like, fett is in it though like yeah it's literally just like story. mandalorian season 2.5 it's yes. completely pointless and again to circle background to doc 2 that's the kind of approach i'm worried about if they do go with loads of spin-offs mm -hmm. now that they're on disney plus and you know disney wants them to have all these things interconnected mm -hmm. because yeah Doctor Who did have like its own 
spin-off universe back in the first Rusty Davis era. You had Sarah Jane Adventures and Torchwood, but they were very kind of standalone things. Mm -hmm. There were occasional crossovers in the main show, and you know, the Doctor appeared in a couple of Sarah Jane Adventures episodes. But on the whole, like they gave you the context. It wasn't like you needed to understand like you needed to watch all of them. It was more just like a fun crossover independent of anything else. It wasn't like you have that crossover in the main show and then suddenly something's completely different in the next episode and you're like, hang on a minute, what happened? It's like, oh, you got to go watch that random Sarah Jane Adventures episode to see what happened. It's no, it's like, I guess it's it helps where you got a singular character who can travel anywhere and everywhere. They can just do whatever. Probably the, the biggest thing Doctor Who did like that was between Torchwood season one and season two, mm -hmm. where the main character, Captain Jack Harkness, you know, he'd started off on the main show of Doctor Who, then got his own spin off. And then but at the end of Torture Series One, there's this big cliffhanger of, oh, what happened to Captain Jack? Uh, and then you go to the main show where you see him reunite with the Doctor. They have an adventure in the Series 2 finale. But by the end of that, he decides to go back to Torchwood. Torture Season 2 opens. It, they're still, they still don't know where Captain Jack is. And then he returns. And there's this big thing of, where were you? And, you know, they still allude to it. It wasn't like they just, he's just back. And it's like, okay, well, I'm back now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that cliffhanger was just, you know, it, it would be the equivalent of, the thing with Grogu disappearing and then you have your bit in Book of Boba Fett but the start of season three of Mando still has Grogu away and then they reunite you know that that's the way you should do that of you can still have your crossovers you can still permeate into other things but you don't want it to have too much of a lasting effect that it just makes everything a mess and you've got to put out all these paperwork to be like okay well which episode do I now need to watch to understand this thing and, and it's just yeah it's so badly handled at the moment yeah and it'll be worse for doctor who because the most of the newest season is going to be a disney plus but the older seasons are on hbo max yeah so it's and if you're irish you can't watch anything at all apparently <laughs> so it's a mess for them yeah and it'll be hard for them to have any kind of spinoff with like i don't know what characters they would have like the master or like if they plan on having a david tenet spinoff with like Catherine tate but like yeah. To try and do that and then for fans to like understand their story and their background, they wouldn't be able to go to Disney Plus for that. They'd have to go to a completely different streaming service. Yeah, it's a tricky thing. And again, that's why you need to make sure when you build stuff, you have all the context you need. Like, mm -hmm. uh, again, to use Andor as an example, right. you go, hey, we want this story with all these ideas. It's like, okay, what character already exists? can we then put into that rather than trying to build it around them? Because then you can provide all the context for that character's existence. Like with Andor, actually, you don't need to watch Rogue One to understand who Andor is because the show tells you all of that. Mm -hmm. It treats him like a new character, and that's the way you got to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not like dropping the master or some companion into something suddenly and just being like, well, you know who they are, just enjoy it. You know, it's like, you know, they, they rebuild them up as a character for any potential new audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does remind me of WandaVision, how that show came out after um, like Infinity War and Endgame, mm. and that was like the start of her villain arc. And then you start watching Multiverse of Madness, and Wanda is already like in her villain arc, in her villain era. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and for fans who didn't watch WandaVision, they have no idea why she's exactly. like this or what happened to yeah. Vision. So they're lost. Yeah, yeah. it's one of those things. It's like, it, if you want to do something like that, to use like a spin-off example if you want that big twist to happen you want to then integrate that into something that benefits both the spin-off and the main show like you want like a crossover where anything important happening to that character that will change everything going forward preferably would happen in the main show where you've got the most eyes on it and the most because it's the centerpiece and then anyone watching the spin-off would probably have already been watching the main show so it's not like you have something big happen to captain jack in the spin-off that then he shows up again in the main show and it's like Oh, well, I, we expect that you've seen this because. Sorry, you're going to have to repeat what you said because yep. you cut that <laughs> for a second. That's okay. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember where I started. Like, um, yeah, so it's kind of like, but because like the, the main show of Doctor Who is like the centerpiece, kind of like, yeah, Star Wars, the movies are the centerpiece. You want anything drastically that changes to happen in those centerpieces rather than it happening in a spin off that then affects the centerpiece. Because, like you said, with the WandaVision thing, most people watching that movie probably didn't actually see WandaVision. Mm -hmm. So they're now confused because the context isn't given in that movie. So if you wanted to do that, like 
with Torchwood and Doctor Who, you give the context in Doctor Who so that both sets of fans, in a way, understand what's going on. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, I did want to ask you, for Doctor Who, I was curious, like, what part of Doctor Who is, like, your favorite era, like, Russell T. Davis or Stephen Moffat, and what would be something you would want to see happen in future Who, you know? Yeah, um, so, obviously... My nostalgic era is like the Chris Eccleston and David Tennant era because obviously that was when I was a kid and, and growing up with it. But in terms of like the era, like the era I appreciate the most in terms of narrative and being able to like analyze it and the ambition of it is like the Peter Capaldi era because that was like the most high concept it's been, mm -hmm. you know, so many interesting stories and they really tried to experiment with what they could do and and change a lot. And yeah, it's just kind of stuff like that where it's mixing in the high concept stuff with like the campy fun, you know, switch your mind off kind of things. And yeah, I, I just think Doctor Who has so much more potential than it ever really taps into, especially recently, where it's like a lot of like, oh, okay, we've got another episode in like 1900s or 1800s England. Or, you know, that kind of rough, so much time is always the same places the same villains, the same companion archetypes. It just feels like they're constantly recycling ideas. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I just want them to see them take more risks because, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with classic format with different storytelling ideas. And a lot of people are turned off by it, by the lower budget or the mm -hmm. black and white visuals and the early, early seasons. But I like to think that they took a lot more like that liberties with, kind of settings and what they were doing with their story sense and I, I just want to see it kind of try and do that where they're, they're not afraid to set a story 30 years in the future where everyone's wearing tinfoil suits and driving hover cars because right. they, they weren't they weren't scared to to be wrong about that but it feels like the modern writers are like because in 20 years someone watch it and laugh at us <laughs> so you know I, I feel like it's just important to, to not be afraid of just telling the story you want to tell and not worry about matching up to whether it ages well visually yeah i definitely agree with you on that and i feel like because of like the modern era and technology um a lot of tv shows rely on like cgi and like taking the easy way out when it comes to like storytelling mm. and they don't want to try something a little more adventurous or something a little more different and i feel yeah. like series 10 um like you said of doctor who was a really good season it was a really solid season as well and i would like to see series 14 take some notes from that part of doctor who um me personally i like christopher eccleston best as a doctor yeah but i enjoy peter capaldi because i feel like he's the most like the doctor would actually be in real life like yeah not someone who's like charismatic and fun and like sometimes sad but like someone who's like bitter and like angry and like old and has like been through like a lot and he needs a break you know i feel like peter capaldi mm. is like very like quintessential doctor to me in my mind and yeah i'm excited to see what's happening with the new doctor who but at the same time i am worried because i feel like the three series that they did with david Tennant was just like a strange break or like a strange thing to try out in terms mm. of doctor who you know what I mean? Because I don't feel like it was needed. Mm. I it found like... about those three specials. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no sorry. <laughs> Network. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> Messed up there. <laughs> okay, no, I was just going to say, um, yeah, the thing I found weird about those three specials was how technically the start of this whole new era that they're doing when they're starting from a clean slate. Because obviously you can't watch Duty Gatwa's first episode without having watched that because that that's labeled a special four four on disney plus hang on a minute what's going on here what's all this stuff mm -hmm. and then special two and three and it's like now i feel like i need to go back and watch it it doesn't really achieve what they want to do this completely clean start without all this required viewing because you get specials yeah i I'm trying to be positive in terms of the future of Doctor Who, but I feel like from what we see with Star Wars and there's so many like spin-offs that they've tried to do and 
not a lot of them have done well. If they try to do the same thing with Doctor Who, it's just going to, like, you're just going to make, you're just going to repeat the same mistake you've already made, you know? Like, yeah. One spinoff that I actually liked and I thought that was good was Obi-Wan. I feel like it was a hmm. very interesting character study into this okay. who Obi-Wan is. But I feel like the middle was not great because there are a lot of narrative changes. You're bringing a lot of characters in. There are a lot of things that are not well supported within the show. So if they wanted to do like maybe a short special on Obi-Wan and like us learning more about him in the context of who he is, that would have been fine. But it also feels unnecessary because Obi-Wan mm -hmm. was a character in the original Star Wars movies. And yeah. not many people are watching the original Star Wars movies. So it really just feels like you're just trying to revive an old era of Star Wars just for the sake of nostalgia, once again, which is not needed. But, you know, content brain. Mm. Again, like like you mentioned, uh, Obi-Wan probably would have been better as like a movie or just like an extended like hour and a half episode just on its own but it's like the whole of obi-wan the show into just one movie and they've cut out a lot of the filler and unnecessary and weird decisions like the the infamous child layer chase scene where it's just mm -hmm. like that just feels so tonally off and just weird and unnecessary they could just have her getting kidnapped anyway or just or even off screen and this is one of those things where they just cut out a lot of the fluff and the filler and turned it into a movie and it just works so much better mm -hmm. but, Because so much of that show is completely paced weirdly and just written badly. It just yeah. makes the whole thing seem like, why does this exist? Yeah. Um, real quick. Sorry, I have to do this for editing. Um, can you check your connection? I feel like you just like... Oh, sorry. A what bit. was that? Oh, sorry. Uh, internet cut out again. It seems no. to be doing that a lot. A second. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I was just checking on my side. I was like... I see like there's just like a little bit of break when you're talking so it's like i want to be sure i'm getting him like coming through yeah and no, i i think there's like a bit of a delay now i think um i think because there's been so much lag probably on my end this now i think you you stop talking and then it probably you're still talking on my side for a little bit so i'm waiting for the response like oh. <laughs> that's probably why there's the gap <laughs> okay because yeah my, my internet is, can be really bad so i think it's it's perfectly fine. It's okay. Mine gets weird too. So I was just like making sure it was. In one of its me. periods where it's really stuttering every five seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There was just a break when yeah, you no, were I... just like looking at me oh, and yeah. then there was talking and I was like, it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I can edit around it. I just wanted to let you know because I don't want to. Yeah, no. Like, oh, yeah, no. It just happens to think of shit. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I think. I think we're oh. back in one of the moments where you're it's, it's working. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. If you ever cut okay. me off or interrupt me, you could just keep going. It's totally okay. 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 Uh, what I might try to do really quickly, it might probably might kick me out the corner. I might have to rejoin the mic because I've got two internets. Sometimes one works better than the other. Okay. So I might try and switch to the. The other one for the rest of the call. So I'm just going to quickly try that and hopefully hopefully that fixes it at least for the the rest. Okay, yeah, go ahead and try that. Okay. All right, I'm on I'm on the new one, so Okay. I, I hopefully hopefully we're back to work. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay. Um we were talking about Right, the specials. Okay. When oh, no. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, no. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think. Okay. Maybe. Maybe it's working. <laughs> okay. I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Good. Okay. I'm just going to clap so that when I'm editing, I know where to yeah. cut. Okay, great. So, like I said with the specials, I feel like I feel very tentative about this partnership with Disney Plus. Also, yeah. because there's going to be a Mandalorian movie coming out soon, mm. and we don't need it. Like, 
We yeah. don't need a movie. We didn't need the specials, if we're being honest. Like, all I really wanted was my next season with Nichiti Gatwa, and it gave me these three weird specials with, like, David Tennant and Catherine Tate, like... Yeah, uh, I, th- I think the reason they did that was to kind of give fans, like, a bit of a... Break? Like, a shot in the arm, kind of, like, to be like, okay, well, this is how things are going to be, you know, because obviously there was a lot of uh, kind of lost... Not like there wasn't much goodwill if, towards the show mm-hmm. after the Chibnall era. There was a lot of controversy. Mm-hmm. Fans were kind of burnt out on it. I think what they wanted with the specials was not only to celebrate the show's 60th anniversary year, kind of as well. They just kind of wanted to give that boost to be like, hey, okay, look, it's going to be it's, it's stuff you know. It's kind of like the consistent stuff. It's stuff you can trust. You know, bring in some of those lost fans to be like it's the the partnership you liked of David Tennant and Catherine Tate with Russell T Davis writing. You know, it's it's a lot of the familiar stuff. It's just obviously it's not a long term thing mm-hmm. that they should have should do. I think the three episodes were fine because it, yeah, it brought a lot of people back. It kind of reassured a lot of people in a way that the show wasn't dead. You know, it could still be good. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I think it was kind of their way of just yeah. Kind of fixing it up a little bit to then give to the shoot to get with the 15th doctor and kind of have the foundation to be like it's not like a complete jump into the unknown if we've got that safety net of being like okay we know it can be still be solid so yeah and i did want to ask you because i was curious um i feel like a lot of times with doctor who the canon changes very often <laughs> you know things are adjusted things are changed and that's fine because like science fiction time is wobbly Money, yeah time, you know um and then in the chris chibnall era with the timeless child a lot of things were changed in series 12 and now with the specials in by generation mm. we now have two doctors assisting at the same time so i wanted to get your take on it because i know that you already did a youtube video talking about mm. it but just for the listeners i want to get like your opinion on what do you think about like by generation and like the ever-changing canon in doctor who yeah so first of all when it comes to like canon i just tend to a lot of people just follow the basic guideline of there is no canon Mm -hmm. because because of just how much everything's changed and there's no way to like you have with something like star wars where you know they can print an official timeline in the front of every book and be like okay here's where everything happened and you have like your your actual agreed upon canon made by the official disney channels and everything with with doc 2 there are so many different avenues for the show, like licensing and stuff going on. It's easier just to treat as like whatever really you feel like fits where you can just kind of put that in. Obviously, I I don't say it liberally enough as like, oh, I'll just believe some random fan fiction or some headcanon or something like that. It's like, as long as it's something that's a licensed product that's a, a, official, I can then accept that as part of my own headcanon and whatever I prefer. But in terms of like the big stuff like Time of Children and By Generation, they're they're controversial because a lot of people don't really have that same approach to canon they they think you know everything in the show is exactly kind of the way it should be and then kind of you know some books here and there and so i think when stuff like that changes quote unquote canon it it can upset a lot of people because it it changes stuff we thought we knew and not necessarily in a way where it's part of the story where it's more of just a way like, oh, they're just randomly throwing this in. Now, like with The Timeless Children, obviously, a lot of people, like, you know, the show presented the Doctor as, you know, the first Doctor through to the 13th Doctor, you know, numbered incarnations, you know, that there was a fourth Doctor episode where there were some implications that it had previous incarnations, but equally that could also be implications as to another Time Lord in the scene. It was his past incarnations as well so they had leeway there and so when the time of children came along it was a very big thing to kind of just drop onto the fans to kind of be like yeah no everything that whole ordering system the whole lifespan of doctor the the character you thought you knew is very it's just completely different now Mm -hmm. and a lot of people were upset about that because they thought it changed the themes i I, at the time was one of those people i thought oh it ruins the character of the doctor and stuff in the years since i've kind of come to accept it is that it doesn't really matter too much it doesn't actually change all that much it just changes stuff from like a history wise it's been like oh you know they had all these lives before but the 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 episode itself presents it as you know the, the doctor's memory was wiped after each 
cycle so it doesn't really change too much because it's like okay well the doctor as we know them still exists from william hartnell to now shooting Gatwa. that's still untouched it's just there's some stuff before that there that they can probably explore if they wanted but they probably won't touch upon because in the uh, 1996 tv movie there was infamously a moment where the doctor claimed he was half human on his mother's side mm -hmm. and fans have always been outraged and that saying oh that's that's ridiculous and that's just something they just never went on with they just kind of just silently just pretended never happened you know and i feel like that's that's something they can always do with these big things like the time of children it was it was there in the children era they're probably not going to explore it much going further. They're just going to say it existed. It's done now. That story was told and they're just going to move on from it. So it's the case. If it's not, like they're going to keep changing things. By generation, I think is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I think that changes so much more implications, especially with uh, Russell T. Davis. He, he kind of like half jokingly said in like, I think the commentary for the episode that every previous doctor by generated when they died. So they then still got to go off by themselves and didn't actually regenerate and i think that's more damaging than the time of children because it devalues the idea of regeneration because so many of these iconic moments are when the doctor you know quote unquote dies yes they regenerate but that's like the last time that actors in the role at least unless they come back you know it's it's an ending point of an era of the show but to then say that oh no they just split off and then the the doctor who died can just still go on and do whatever it's just this weird kind of idea for the show where it's like it's kind of a, a bit damaging i think towards the uh constant ongoing nature i think the way it's presented in the episode itself is is fine it's a bit weird and obviously with the current like social political landscape it's not exactly giving you to get with the best foundation mm -hmm. for like potential detractors to be like oh well he doesn't count because, you know, they didn't actually physically show a proper handover like they usually do. It's obviously, when you think about the casting and everything, it's kind of a, it's a weird way to do that. But, yeah, it, it's kind of an unfortunate thing. The, the way I don't like it is because it was with David Tennant, where he's like the poster boy of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. He's the one they always try and bring back and plaster over everything. It very much yeah. felt like they were scared to get rid of him again they wanted to keep that in their back pocket to be like well now we can bring him back whenever because he is this bi-generated version he he still eventually becomes the 15th doctor because they imply that although we have no idea how that happens or anything like that but now they just have him sitting there on earth and they can just bring him back whenever and i just think yeah it's not a, a good thing to set where you've got the shadow of this previous doctor still looming a bit over the new one but I think with Shutagawa's performance, he is he, he's made a name for himself already. He's kind of shown he can stand on his own. I don't think he has been overshadowed, but it's just that still it's lingering in the back of just, well, David Tennant's 14th Doctor is still out there, mm. you know? He's <laughs> just wandering in the shadows, just like yeah, literally for yeah. his chips. Sitting there in the garden having picnics. He can still <laughs> just go up whenever he wants. And it's right. kind of, it's not... The way the show usually operates That's because true. these characters have time machines they can already show up whenever they want you don't need to you know jump through these hoops to have him still sitting around mm -hmm. i have to say i definitely agree with you because yes the canon is like flimsy at times so you don't have to put mm. like that much faith into the canon but you're right in saying that like regen by generation somehow being seen as something that's like that every doctor has done does dilute and like takes away the impact of a yeah. lot of regenerations especially from like you know david Tennant. from like watching crystal christopher eccleston turn into david Tennant was like huge for me to see that and then seeing david Tennant kind of go off and like watching like rose having to like mourn the loss yeah, of like exactly. her doctor you yeah know, for that to not be a thing anymore and for them to try and rewrite history is definitely not an easy thing to sit with as a fan yeah and i felt the same way with the timeless child because in my mind i was trying to like think like well we don't know a lot about gallifrey or the doctor's past mm. and i feel like that's the purpose of doctor who that this is just yeah. such a mysterious alien creature that's just like traveling and like people are so mystified by like who he or she is and whenever you learn a lot about like the doctor's past you don't really know if it's like solid because yeah the doctor doesn't know 
So we are in it with the doctor trying to understand what's going on and what their past is. And we can't really see that. And I feel like with um, the specials, it helps like tie the story together, especially with the regenerations mm-hmm. and everything. Um, and I feel like the specials are like a lot better. But I feel like with the three specials, you are right in saying that, that they were scared and going from Jody Whitaker to Nishisi Gatwa because I did see like a lot of talk and like at least on Tumblr and like some of my circles that like it feels like a disservice because yeah. Nishisi Gatwa this is gonna seem rude but he's not Jody Whitaker you know like a lot of American audiences ha- have not seen Broadchurch mm. I have but they haven't yeah. so they don't know who she is they only yeah. know her as the doctor and a lot of people know who Nichiji Gatwa is. It's because sex education is on an international platform. Yeah. So when he became the doctor, it was more of like a lift for Doctor Who rather than for himself. Because even though he's yeah. like, oh, I'm the doctor. This is amazing. This is great. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Really, like the doctor is like, Doctor Who is like being uplifted by his presence. And of course, like mm. he can hold his own as an actor. And I don't feel like David Tennant being the 14th doctor does a disservice. I just yeah. feel like that was not something that they should have done. It was obvious that you take like the canon is flimsy and you kind of run with it. And then you make these decisions that don't really make any sense. If someone's Mm. watching it without the outside perspective of like the news, like Twitter and like fan theories and like BBC executives being like, well, our fans don't like a female doctor and we're bringing in a black doctor and they might think that's weird. But if we bring back David Tennant, who already has seven different jobs, he doesn't need to come back as a doctor. That man literally just hosted the Baptist. But I guess if he wants to come yeah. back, that's fine. He's like 50 now. But like, I mean, sure. I, I I guess what, what they wanted to do with it was obviously serve as this bridge, not only yet, because they wanted to have something to celebrate the 60th with without suddenly starting this new era suddenly when it wasn't ready yet. Uh-huh. Um, they, they wanted something so they can just put in David Tennant in there to kind of bridge the gap. So, like I said, someone everyone knows, everyone likes, and it's a very safe thing right. to kind of transition in a way, right. kind of the, the eras. And also, the, the the one positive I see with the bi generation is kind of they want it, they want to achieve a similar effect to how they did with Christopher Eccleston, where it's when you start this new series, it's just the doctor's there. You don't have to then watch like a special to see him regenerate from his other person to understand how he came about or why they're acting so weird. Mm-hmm. Like they wanted to do this thing of like they they split him apart. They just they have all like the regeneration madness or whatever just hand waved away by saying, Well, because of the bi generation, the fourteenth doctor goes to all that. So by the time the fifteenth doctor shows up, he's just fine. He's already sorted out as a character, like Christopher Eccleston was with the ninth doctor, where in series one, when we first meet him, he's already established in like his own mind as the doctor. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have any weird fish fingers and custard moment or anything like that. Mm-hmm. He's already ready to go. You can just start there. And I guess that's what they want with series 14. They just wanted to do all the weird regeneration backstory, everything, sort that out before the launch of the new series. Mm-hmm. But then again, it still gets weird where there you have special four which is then like the episode everyone should be starting with, mm-hmm. which kind of, yeah, devalues the point of it all. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah I... no, it, it, sorry, I was going to say, yeah, it, it works well as kind of making the Doctor this character that already exists and already has an idea of himself ready for the new viewers to come in because then they're not having to worry about like, oh, how did he change from this other person or how does this all work? Mm-hmm. I, I, I was just going to say that like... Um it's clear that they want to hit the ground running Mm. with the new series. And I think it's coming out, it's coming out in May. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. May 10th slash 11th. I initially thought it was coming out in April. Mm. Um, So I think I was like mistaken there, but I feel like in terms of Dr. Who and whatever is next, I wait tentatively holding my breath because in all honesty, I'm worried that it won't be that great. And mm. I don't have, it's not like I have no faith in Russell T. Davis because as much as I want to harp on the specials, I actually like them. I yeah. feel like the one in space 
with like the two doctors and the two Donnas was the best because mm. that special in my mind felt the most like Doctor Who to me. Because yeah. the one thing that I always loved about Doctor Who is watching an episode and not knowing what's going to happen, not yeah. knowing who the villain is, not knowing how it's going to end or who's going to survive, but just mm. hoping at the end of it that both the Doctor and the Companion make it. And when it's an episode where everybody <laughs> but the Doctor and the Companion survive, it's like, see, this is my this is my Doctor. That's my shit mm. right there. I want that back. You know, I don't, I, I'm okay with like Chibnall's era and everything like that, but like I want stakes. You know? See, I, I think that's why they did those specials was yeah. to kind of, again, like reassure fans that like we can still do Doctor Who because mm. a lot of people were complaining that the Chibnall era didn't really feel like Doctor Who. It didn't really have the the same vibe or like you said, the same stakes or anything like that. It, it did for a, a certain audience, obviously, that the Chibnall era does have, it fa have its fans. But the majority of people tend to agree that compared to a lot of the other stuff we got in New Who, mm -hmm. most of the Chibnall era was a lot weaker. It didn't they didn't have the emotional impact. It didn't feel as well structured. Mm -hmm. So I guess with the specials, they just wanted to 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 put it in a way that I, I don't want it to come across as insincere, but like to show that Doctor Who can still be good in a yeah. way. It's, you know, it's it's a very blunt way because, you know, Same. there were good elements of the Chimney era, but it was more of just reassuring fans that, hey, we can still make stuff that you expect to see from Doctor Who. Yeah. And I do want to say, in regards to the Chimney era, I think that Doctor Who or like the creators, the executives, they put so much faith in this writer who put out like a few good Doctor Who episodes and like also, like you said, um, was a head writer of Torchwood, but to be the head of Doctor Who and to steer that ship is not an easy job. Oh, and no. I could say a lot of things about Stephen Moffat, as many people have. But one thing that you can say is that at least he knows how to write that show. And at least he yeah. did a good job with it. And when you don't have somebody that kind of like meets that same expectation or that same caliber, you cannot help but like compare them and just see it as like mediocre. Like, was Jodie Whittaker's arc the best? No. But was it good? Yeah, you could say so. You know, it was Yeah, it, it was it's, it's one of those, it was. It's one of those weird things. Doctor Who has always had this problem of like the current showrunner slash doctor is the worst thing ever uh -huh. until the next one <laughs> yeah think about like a lot of the the hardcore classic who fans hated the rust the first rusty davis era when it came back they were like oh no, this is too soap opera where's like the the sci-fi in there you know what sort of like stuff but you know to a lot of people it was great and then Moffat comes along people are like oh this is terrible you know he's the worst ever he's too confusing all these twists you know that he makes the companions too important and everything and he goes away and then chibnall comes along and everyone's like well chibnall sucks where did Moffat, right. why did Moffat have to go away Moffat was really good mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's and it, you even see it now people are like oh russell t davis is awful right. why why is he doing this like these episodes are terrible or, like right. this casting is terrible and it's just this constant cycle of people always comparing things to the media what came before or you know who they how they expect it to be ahead rather than just kind of like viewing it for what it is because it's this, this, this tricky thing of like yeah because you're everything in the past you have sort of sense of nostalgia for like me of the first davis era mm -hmm. i have a lot of nostalgia for it obviously i can acknowledge a lot of the like parts where it went badly or you know, it wasn't great mm -hmm. and stuff but on the whole i have kind of a nostalgia for it when you're watching it as it's coming out obviously with an older cynical brain like you you understand more about media it's harder to like skip over those bad things in the moment because when you're a kid you don't notice it you know you may go oh i not didn't like that episode or that looked a bit weird right. but you don't think much of it but now if you're to watch a new episode that has those same issues where you've got that that more critical brain and stuff now you kind of see it and you go well that looks terrible don't like that and here's why mm -hmm. and you kind of just immediately dissect it in your head rather than just kind of immersing yourself and enjoying it yeah. so it's such a tricky thing to to tightrope walk where they've got to try and balance, yeah, th those fun, nostalgic vibes in the moment. And, yeah, kind of actually high concept, good stuff mm -hmm. without the pitfalls of nostalgia, I guess. Yeah, I 100% agree with you on that. Um, in terms of Doctor Who, I do want to say, I feel like, God, I feel like um, Matt Smith and Jenna Coleman's 
season. I don't remember which season exactly it was, but I feel like that may have been my least favorite one just because like it felt very like Stephen Moffat's doing the same thing over again. And I don't feel like there's something. Yeah. A a lot of people don't tend to like, uh, because that's uh, Series 7B, as it's called, because obviously Mm -hmm. they're split into two halves, that series. Um, And yeah, a lot of people don't tend to have that same thing of like, they they don't like the pairing of Eleven and Clara. They think they're a bit of a mismatch in terms of characterization. And like, I I am a a fan of Clara as a character. And I, I think that era, that kind of that half series works well for parts but it is very weirdly written in other parts than it could have been done better Mm -hmm. and yeah it does feel like one of those things of Moffat had these grand story arcs that he wanted to tell but kind sometimes it kind of felt like what he wanted wasn't necessarily able to achieve in Doctor Who in its format at the time Mm -hmm. he kind of wanted to write this heavily serialized thing with these overarching storylines but the show wasn't really equipped to do that at the time. Like now it would probably work out quite well. We could probably have more connected episodes, more like a a high budget prestige drama or something. Mm -hmm. But back then it kind of felt like he was trying to do all these things of this whole era long, like three series long story arc, but it would just come and go so randomly. And then bits would come up that just didn't seem to just not like mix and match. Like, and then hit the way he'd explain stuff. Just, it didn't, come across right so a lot of people misunderstood it or didn't understand it like with the clara echoes things you know a lot of people don't quite understand those and yeah they yeah so he tries to explain them in the episodes but he doesn't do a good enough job so that people people not because they're they're stupid or anything just because the episode doesn't necessarily do the best job at making it clear what's going on and how it's resolved and how things turn out and everything like that so yeah that is true and i do agree with you on your sentiment where every single time there's a new showrunner people compare them to the old showrunner and they're like oh that showrunner was like better yeah and i think that the only time i've ever seen that happen in any other show that's similar to doctor who was supernatural because Mm. when that show came out it came out i don't remember exactly the year i think it was 2005 and i was fairly young um, but when I started watching the show, like sincerely, there were older fans that I had met that said that people thought the supernatural was bad when it first yeah. started, which makes sense because it wasn't like the best show. It was like two brothers driving this old car. Yes, I think, I think years back, I tried getting into it. I watched like two episodes and I was just like, no, <laughs> this is just, this is not, this is not it. I don't get it. I don't right. get the hype. <laughs> no, I get that. I understand that. And honestly it wasn't until like newer fans started watching the newer seasons and they wanted like supernatural to be like old supernatural Mm. because when people were watching when when the show came out they compared it to smallville and smallville which is a pretty solid show and has really good storylines a lot of people said like supernatural isn't that good but smallville is better and because supernatural continued on and it got new fans the new fans thought that the older seasons were better instead of the newer seasons because the older seasons Mm. had at least a story and a plot and a goal and like they were up until like season three which was shortened because of the writer's strike in 2007 Mm. um there seemed to be like this whole like angels versus like devil's war coming up that people felt like was hinting towards like the end of the world similar to what happens like christian christian theology so when season Mm. four came and that was like something that came into fruition in the season a lot of people liked that better than what was going on in like the newer seasons so i do yeah i do see your point where fans tend to like latch on to the old showrunner and the old doctor mm. and so the newer one because you're experiencing it now like yeah. you're watching joy the Whitaker's episodes now and it's hard to do that and hard to like just like dispend your belief but just take it for what it is and like enjoy exactly, it for yeah. what it is when you're already familiar with something prior so yeah i feel like with the new who people may enter that same like mindset and what i would rather have is people like watch new doctor who and I don't want things to be explained because, like, I understand, mm. like, they're trying to reach the American audience. And honestly, Americans are dumb and they're annoying, okay? There was a whole thing in December where there were musical movies coming out and people didn't know these movies were musicals. When very clearly, if you look at the Wikipedia page, it says, look at this new movie musical of me. I mean, it, in defense of some of that stuff, because uh, I'm friends with uh, another 
a YouTuber called uh, Joe Brennan. He does some uh, Doctor Who stuff and also just some more general stuff. Uh-huh. And he made a great video about like movies, musical movies at the moment are kind of scared to admit they're musicals. So like in the trailers, they'll just try and hide mm-hmm. any semblance. So that's why people were confused when they turned out to be musicals. Yeah. Because when you watch the trailers, there's no hint of them actually being a musical. Uh-huh. So it was kind of this thing of just, yeah, the the marketing, yeah. like, misrepresented the fact that they're a musical. Me, I think I'm just kind of an asshole where <laughs> I'm just kind of like, I don't know how you didn't know. Like, <laughs> I do, ex- I even though sometimes I don't watch trailers, I want to at least know what movie I'm going to watch if I'm going to pay money to watch a movie. Like, things are too expensive. You're not taking my money and I don't know what I'm getting into. <laughs> Like, that's just my mindset. So I mean, I, I guess, like, obviously, you used Mean Girls as an example. I guess yeah. because the majority of people, especially, you know, my generation, know that as a movie, like, just a normal movie, rather than... Because I think it was originally a musical that they then turned into a non-musical movie. Mm. In Yeah, you know, and that, that's the big thing. That's everyone. So when you say, oh, there's a new Mean Girls coming out, you expect it to be, like, the, the movie that most people, ex- like, know of rather than it being an adaptation of the thing that, ad- that the original movie was an adaptation of. It's kind of those things, because sometimes, yeah, you get things where it's, no, this isn't adapting the previous movie. This is adapting the thing that that original movie was adapting. It's just essentially a parallel adaptation. It's just completely ignoring that that one thing. But people don't tend to think that way, yeah. because with a lot of stuff, you don't realize it was ever an adaptation. You You think, oh, it was a movie first, and then they're just making another movie of it. Actually, with Mean Girls, it was like a book, but it wasn't called Mean Girls. It was called something else. Right. And then it was a movie, and then a musical, and then the movie musical came out. Right. Yeah. And... I think because I'm I'm not too familiar with it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm too familiar because I've seen the movie. I've seen the actual musical so many times because I like musicals a lot. Right. <laughs> I'm the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> And that's yeah. obviously, I'm not looking forward to the Beatles episode of Doctor Who, oh which has a musical number in it. What is it with the musical numbers? Like, I, I think it's just the thing they're going for at the moment. Because, yeah, they had the musical number in the Christmas episode, and I think they're going for another one. And, yeah. When has Doctor Who had music in it? I must be missing something. There, there's been some, like, elements of, like... So there was the um, the, uh, the Daleks in Manhattan, uh, obviously when they're in 1930s New York, they had a little bit of a musical number there, mm-hmm. but it was just kind of like a, a side thing. It wasn't like the actual main characters, yeah. but like the, the character doing it was already a musical performer. It was just part of the, the thing. That was like the closest they've really gotten to that. Mm-hmm. I can't think of anything where actually, yeah, they'll, they'll do like the musical thing of break into song and yeah it's it's weird it was a weird thing but as much as i i don't like it personally i do like that they're at least trying something new and pushing the boundaries of like the genres and experimenting a bit i'd I'd rather have it try and do something new and fail rather than just play it safe all the time Mm -hmm. yeah i have to disagree i feel like doctor who can keep the musicals out of it like (laughs) as much as i love musicals you don't have to have to do a musical number for everything because hmm. there was a weird thing going on in American TV in like 2015, 2016. I think it may have been later than that. But the final season of a lot of shows turn into musical seasons or had a musical episode. Right. And there's a show called Riverdale that had a lot of musical episodes. Which I've heard infamous stuff about Riverdale, <laughs> just the complete insanity of that show. Yeah. Uh, there's a great... I- was it? I think it was Super Eye Patch Wolf did a great video just covering just everything about it. And like the yes. whole, there was like a, a weird virus infection episode and the next episode it was just gone. <laughs> like people were turning into zombies and then it just got, <laughs> just stopped suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it was strange. So to see like the musical numbers thing pop back up, I'm like, mm. oh no, I can't, ha- we can't have that again. And I say it's more like, because yeah, I tend to just, uh an example was uh the boys i i watched the boys that's mm-hmm. an amazon prime show uh that's quite quite good i i think it's not as great it kind of got too nihilistic for its own good and just mm-hmm. they kept losing and i have this thing where if i see a like protagonist get beaten down too much i'm just like sorry mate i'm just i'm just <laughs> sorry you're 
I can't root for you if all you do is lose, you know. <laughs> I think you have to have at least have small victories. And it, I think it was the end of one of the boys' season. You know, it was finally they finally seemed like they were about to get like a small victory, yep. and then it got even worse. And I'm just like, I just don't know if I care anymore. <laughs> but yeah, that they had a, a musical episode in one one season. I think it was season three, and I just skipped right through. I was just, this is awful. Oh, I just yeah, hate yeah. this. Yeah. It's like they're in a hospital or something. It's all like a like a hallucination and it was just awful so awful <laughs> do you like gen v better uh, i haven't actually watched it that's the thing like i kind of just fell off the the boys bandwagon i was just like yeah. I, I think season four is coming out this year or something but i don't really yeah it it's is. like i'm just kind of like whatever about it now once again with the spinoffs you kind of have to watch gen v before you watch season four if you plan on watching it I, I think i've briefly read the like plot synopsis of each episode on like wikipedia <laughs> Just to kind of like that's not the same thing as watching it going on yeah because it just didn't seem like my kind of show like okay. so i was just like okay i'll just get a rough idea of what the show is about i do have to say at least try watching episode one because i do have to say i feel like gen v has the same energy and excitement mm. that i had when i watched season one of the boys right you know, it's kind of like this is something that's in the same universe and it's interesting because they expanded upon what you already know about the boys but you're yeah. bringing in like normal people i mean they're soups but they're like kids you know like they're yeah. in college and i feel like it's really interesting because it's a college show there aren't a lot of college shows there and all of the mm. kids seem relatively normal like they seem like everyday kids you would meet outside the fact that yeah. they have powers and <laughs> it's actually good like i would say like right. it's, it's it's a very fairly good show um i would just give it a chance because me personally i'm not watching season four of the boys because <laughs> Whenever they make a show that reflects the times too similarly, I'm like, you know what, guys? Y'all can keep that. I don't need your metaphors. I don't need your subtleties. I don't need the parallels. I see It's what's one of those things where it's like there's a certain amount of like, you know, that I appreciated with like the, the metaphors and the yes. commentary and stuff. And then it's like sometimes I do just want escapism from shows. Yes. Right? It's one of those things where it's like, I, I can acknowledge this. I don't want them to stop doing that. I just will yeah. probably not watch it as much and just focus on stuff for escapism. And I'll get around to it eventually. But it's just you've got to be in a certain mood to watch those kind of mm -hmm. very gritty, dark, thematic shows. And it's yeah. sometimes you do just want to have like your vibes of, you know, a weird person and his human companion flying through time and <laughs> space getting up to hijinks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So as long as you just want that, like, refresher, just like, you know, TV shows can just be fun and not brain dead, like, in terms of, like, a way of, like, I don't want to think, but, like, yeah. just kind of a way of, like, they're, they're fun for first and foremost, and then you can break them down for the themes and everything like that, like, yourself. Exactly. And that's what, I think that's what um, I feel about the new season of Doctor Who, just to bring it back. Um, I know they're trying to pull in the American audience, and, like, I'm not trying to be an asshole when I say Americans are dumb, but they're kind of dumb. Like, just a little bit. Like, I live here. I interact with them all hey, just, time. Yeah, just, just for the record, <laughs> it's the American that's saying it's not, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but they're kind of dumb. And I feel like I want Doctor Who to go back to, like, you know, I want Weeping Angels. I don't want, like, easy Dalek episodes every single episode. Like, I want you to bring back the Ood, the Centurions. Like, I want something, like different i want like the cybermen but i want like to feel like i need to hold my breath while watching this that's, show and yeah and that, that's like... another thing of like in you, you kind of i found myself over the last couple of years wondering it's like <laughs> was the show ever like that good or was it just because i was a kid mm. you know and it's like i was like the audience that didn't think and it's obviously like and i wonder it's like am i ever going to get to that point where i do hold my breath again it's like yeah. is that because the show's bad now or is that just because I'm too old in a way or whatever to like properly feel those feelings again. And mm -hmm. It's one of those weird things. It's like, are, are we as like a collective fan base always trying to chase that dragon of how it felt as we were a kid? Mm -hmm. It's like a weird thing. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that, that there are definitely ways that, that there are some episodes in this series that I'm very excited for. They do seem like they can be like legitimately good. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I think that the first episode does have like a horror kind of vibe with like a, a horrifying monster mm -hmm. kind of creepy thing going on so that could give that kind of fear element in and then it looks like one of the episodes is going to go a unique way of like just kind of keeping the doctor out of the action 
and it's going to be all up to everyone else to kind of deal with everything going on. It looks like they're trying to, yeah, do things that not just worked before, but keeping them in a way that feels fresh. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, like, I feel excited for it, but at the same time, I, because there are so many things to watch now, it's not the same as it was when you were younger. That, like, that's always the problem with Doctor Who. It's like, yeah. it's always got to feel like must watch TV. And that's mm -hmm. why I feel like it like fell apart a bit in the Chibnall era because it didn't become, it wasn't really must watch TV anymore. Mm -hmm. It was kind of just the thing if you could take it or leave it. And for a show as influential, especially like in the European landscape, mainly Britain now rather than how it used to be it used to be obviously a huge cultural thing across the entire continent but now so it's more of just like a britain thing where it's like you you won't find anyone on the street now that watches it they they'll probably have watched it when they're a kid and moved on mm -hmm. and it's trying to get that back to being must watch tv with these really powerful amazing genuinely well written stories and that's yeah i, I think they will get there maybe not straight away but i think at least i hope with series 14 season one that they can at least build that platform to again reassure fans to go like it's it, the specials weren't just a, a fluke you know we can actually have genuinely decent doctor who episodes again mm -hmm. yeah and i hope that when people watch the new season of doctor who they will want to watch older seasons of doctor yeah. who you know and be inspired to like you know see what else was there and i do wish that like all the seasons of Doctor Who went on Disney Plus, but I don't understand licensing. So. Yeah, it, it's a thing of like, I think they signed a contract with HBO Max, I think up to like 2025 or something like that. Okay. So they can't then obviously go back on that to then give it to Disney. So it's this whole thing of like, yeah, they're having to work around with these contracts and I guess change the show itself to try and then work on Disney Plus as if it's a fresh start. Mm -hmm. And then I imagine when the HBO Max still runs out, they'll be able to get it all on Disney Plus before right. this. Yeah, it's just creates this very weird scattered idea of especially people that might want to get into the show ahead of the series. They won't have an easier way of watching it because they'll have to go onto a different platform for mm -hmm. it where it's all ordered differently and all like that. And it's yeah, but I, I think it will. It's one thing like when, when people get into Doctor Who, they and, and like really get into it. They do want to see so much of it. and where you've got that you know almost 20 years now of the modern take on the show to go back to there's so much for them to then dive into and it will just make them more of a fan because it will allow them to like get more into the mythology of the show engage with fans better and then you know if they want to go even further they've then got another 26 years of the classic show to then get into depending on whether that's available to them um so yeah it's, it's a good thing it's like you can almost see it like a YouTube channel. You know, when you find a new YouTube channel you really like, you, you watch a video, you think, oh, that was amazing. And then you go to their channel to watch one. If they don't have anything, you're like, oh, okay. And you just, you don't subscribe. You just kind of leave. But if they've got loads and loads of content to watch, you subscribe, you then you watch more and you become more of a fan. So that's why, yeah, I think it would be great if Disney Plus had the previous stuff because then it would allow people to hop onto the next stuff but i think in this day and age it's probably easy for people to find the the rest of new who and kind of get into that because there's so much to kind of hop into and enjoy from it yeah that's true that's true um do you have any final thoughts about dr who i had one but it just escaped me <laughs> um, oh wait i was just gonna say um i i'm just kind of like gonna have hope for the new who because it's the same mm. thing with like for me the house of dragon because yeah. i was such a huge game of thrones fan and with house Fine. of dragon i knew it was something different it's like a different spin -off. yeah but it's the same thing with the mandalorian as well where at the end of season two i was watching it and i thought okay mm. grogu is not coming back anymore he's home now yeah and then i watched book of boba fett and then there's grogu and also mando so it's like okay this is not the yeah. book of boba fett this is like you said mando 2.0 you know mm. and then with house of dragon it's something that's obviously different from game of thrones it's yeah kind of like the precursor but in my mind i'm thinking this show can't run for that long because we know what's going to happen at the end and y'all yeah. can't drag it out 
you know but what I, mean? I, I think there's been some talk i don't know whether it's like from like people who actually work on the show whether it's just fan speculation yeah but after like this initial arc of like the um black versus green civil war um they might because the book it's adapting from it's obviously the whole history of the targaryens mm. so and that's only apparently a really small section of it so they might change house of the dragon to be like you know a more anthology led thing mm. so once they're done with this story arc they'll probably go to a different time of the the targaryens i think i've heard talk of that mm -hmm. or at least i'm wishing for that because that would help it keep going for a while because yeah it's what's i think yeah season one was like before the war mm -hmm. season two is basically the majority of stuff happening and they've probably only got like season three and then the stuff immediately after the war isn't really worthy of the tv show like obviously when, when you're familiar with the story it's like well most of this stuff is just kind of like bureaucracy or like weird stuff that doesn't fit anywhere they can't yeah they can't adapt the whole that whole period of history into like the show they'll just have to cut it at somewhere and just be like okay like the war's done that's over now we're not gonna deal with all the aftermath where you got all this weird stuff going on and mm -hmm. they might try to do that but it's a very weird thing to do it's kind of like how uh again with uh dune um mm -hmm. once you get past dune messiah which is yeah. obviously going to be a dune movie uh by the, the current production team it gets completely crazy and weird and you get like worm people and the yeah it's just the whole thing becomes a mess and you get people who become part of a planet and all this when you skip like five billion years in the future and there are clones of everyone you can't adapt that people will get so lost and confused yeah. so they're just going to cut it they've said they're just going to cut it after dune messiah and just end that as it is you know you get dune part one dune part two and dune messiah that's all they're gonna do because yeah. afterwards it just gets too weird okay i did not know that about dune i also honestly i haven't seen the second movie yet which i'm like oh have you not so okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm so behind on it, um, but I wanted to know, like, what are your final thoughts about, like, I guess Doctor Who, Star Wars, and what do you feel like is the future for, like, these franchises? Yeah, so Star Wars seems to have a constantly fluctuating future because it feels like every couple of years they announce, like, ten movies, yeah. and then they cancel nine of them, and the the one that survives goes into production hell, Apparently, becomes a TV show. Taika with TT is supposed to have a Star Wars movie coming out, but... I, feel I think like that that's... got cancelled. Okay, makes sense. And then there was like going to be the Ray sequel movie, but I think that's been like softly cancelled. Yeah. And then there was going to be like a pre, like a prequel, prequel movie, like one way, the, like showing the first ever Jedi. I think that got cancelled, and that was only announced last year. Okay, so it looks like they just don't have faith in their franchise. Yeah, they just have this weird thing. They just constantly announce projects yeah. and then just forget about them, and then go, "Oh yeah, that exists. Oh yeah, we'll just cancel that." And then, yeah, the only thing that seems to actually be going forward in terms of movies is that um, Mandalorian movie because it's part of their TV universe, which will probably be absolutely indecipherable to anyone who hasn't watched any of those shows mm. because it'll be like, hey, the Mandalorian, uh, Omega from the Bad Batch and Ahsoka are teaming up to go to Mount Tantis and to defeat Proto Snoke yeah. or something like that. And everyone's going to be like, what the hell? The Mandalorian and Boba Fett and before the movie? Or are you just going to turn the movie into like a Mandalorian recap for the first time? Exactly. It's just been, it's, it doesn't seem to be like a good idea for like yeah. a big synth like movie thing. It's, it's an awful idea. <laughs> yeah. And it's, so it just seems like it really needs like a proper creative direction. You know, I, I know Dave Filoni, he's obviously in charge of a lot of stuff. He, he has done some good work, but it feels like he is one of those content brain people where it's like well i want to put this character here mm -hmm. rather than being yeah thinking of a story first he wants i want to make a show about ahsoka because she's my favorite character that i created or oh i'm going to bring this character back because i created them this you know yeah all these projects where it seems like they're just badly made fan fiction in a way because you've got this huge fan in charge of everything where she kind of needs some people in there not mm -hmm running the whole thing but just people in there that can think more on the bigger picture and think less fan-led yeah. it's sometimes i've always kind of wondered what doctor who would look like without a hardcore fan in charge mm -hmm. um you know it probably wouldn't end well because you kind of need people that understand everything about the show and what makes it good yeah. but on a whole way it would be good to get that new perspective of like someone that isn't so entrenched with it and doesn't think it has to fit into all these boxes because you know you, you can 
change a lot about it once you kind of realize that, okay, well, it doesn't have to be exactly like it's always been. You can change parts of it without losing the core DNA of it. Mm -hmm. But it's just a, a tricky thing. If like, it's, it would probably be like a bit of a monkey's paw thing to, to wish on. Like, oh, I wish Doctor Who would have a, a radical new direction. And then suddenly everything's a musical or it's a, a kid's cartoon suddenly. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like Paw Patrol meets Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those it's things. You, you really don't upset. want it to go completely off the rails. Right. But it'd be nice to have like a, a Tony Gilroy, Gilroy type come in and just have a story like a, a sci-fi time travel story that just works with doctor who mm -hmm. rather than trying to think all right what 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 doctor who story can i write you know it's like yeah i guess that's the kind of thing i just want doctor who to keep innovating rather than working with what's safe and always doing the same stuff mm -hmm. it's like what you said with andor you want there mm -hmm. to be a story and then you have to be like okay what character i have in the canon that can fit well into the story yeah and it was cassian and andor so that's like what i want for star wars too like i want you to have first of all a show bible because for some reason some disney shows don't have show bibles like a clear-cut <laughs> vision of your show and then we take a character i will say the there. The one time, the the one time like Doctor Who had a show bible uh -huh. was for the ahead of the nineteen ninety six movie. Uh, they were gonna do a TV series in America, like a fresh thing, and they were gonna like reboot it and have the Doctor be half human, uh, fully. The Master was gonna be his brother, and then he was gonna like they were gonna be like fighting over becoming like king of gallifrey basically and they were right like, redesigning the daleks and the cybermen and they just did all this weird lore and stuff oh, and i, I just that. think you know if, if that's anything to go by maybe we don't need a show bible for doctor who <laughs> it's good to have kind of the the core tent or well, yeah. no pun intended tenants right. but to be like um you know the doctor is this character like this is their generic backstory this is what a tardis is these this is the dalek this is the cybermen and then kind of they don't want to like box it in too much and be like well it has to be this or the doctor has to face this kind of it has to go to this type of planet yeah. you know has to have this because that's kind of what they already softly do they're like well the doctor has to have a 21st century human companion because that's the audience of the show yeah. whereas a lot of people including myself want them to get away from that and have different companions from the past or the far future or a different planet and mm. stuff because it kind of feels like they've got this idea in the head of this theoretical show bible it's like okay well this is how the show has to be it's like very structured and ticking off these boxes in terms of like a creative sense of being like okay doctor right we've got that okay we've got the tardis yep and then we've got human companion dalek episode cyberman episode and kind of victorian london setting <laughs> space station like one quarry to double as uh, an alien planet and there you go that's your series right. it's kind of it, you want to kind of approach it in a different way of being like, you know, oh, how about an episode in like a like dealing with a big sci-fi thing, like a Dyson sphere, you know, like a, a very sci like sci-fi concept. You know, Doctor Who's never done that, never had a setting like that. That would be an interesting thing. Or how about using like stretching the medium to its limits? Um, uh, a show I love is Inside Number Nine. I, I don't know if you're familiar oh, with that. It's a very that, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's very kind of a British thing. I don't know if it's really jumped over to other countries as much, but they change, they, they really pushed the limit with its medium. You know, they've had episodes where it's like a director's commentary of a TV movie from the 70s or something. So, you know, it's they every now and then these characters will stop the episode to then talk about something. And then it has this like great twist at the end. Or there was like a, a live episode they did where the whole thing seemed to go wrong. And it, it, they just play with the medium in so many great ways that Doctor Who could also try to do, you know. It's it's something they've played around and expand like expanded media a little bit, but like say an episode where the doctor is stuck in a TV show, like right. replicating his own life. And it's kind of like this whole fake out thing of like, oh, was Doctor Who fake the whole time? Mm -hmm. And to reveal, no, it's just like this weird trick and the doctor is being like tricked into thinking he's not real i think they've done that a couple of times but that's not like the show which most people engage with the most you know m the majority of people don't follow expanded media so there's so many of these great ideas that are done in expanded media that they can cross over into the main show and adapt or take inspiration from to really change things up and and 
mess about with the the formula and the structure of it. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think Doctor Who should take more risk, and mm. it would benefit from taking those risks without worrying about you know upsetting the fandom too much. Yeah, well, because it's one of those things. It's no matter what you do, it'll upset the fan base. Yeah, so. That's true. That's true. Um, but overall, I feel like whatever is next for Doctor Who or Star Wars. I wait tentatively with my fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm going to watch Acolyte, but I think I'm going to wait for people to like, see the first episode. And I think that's me, just, like... yeah, me too. I, I was definitely going to watch it, but now that I saw the, the trailer and I yeah. saw kind of what I guess they're advertising it as, I'm like, okay, this is not what I was excited for. So I'm mm -hmm. probably just going to wait and see. Yeah. And I think that like a lot of times with new shows, a lot of times showrunners or like casting directors feel like they need like big names to like yeah. pull people in but shows like i guess house of dragon it already has like the game of thrones ip behind it but like the only notable character you really have is possibly olivia coleman I not olivia coleman i don't remember her last name but it was olivia the girl who played like the red-headed witch and then matt smith yeah and then all the other actors for the most part are not household names so yeah, obviously, a, a, a lot of them have been in a lot of stuff. Yes, um, they have. Yeah, but yeah, they're not necessarily people you immediately look. You know, it's not like they've, they've wheeled out Tom Cruise in a white wig right. and it's saying, "Here's Damon Targaryen." Right. <laughs> yeah. Like with, most like... people, Sorry, I was, was going to say, saying. most people don't actually really know Matt Smith. They just oh, yeah, go, yeah, yeah, yeah. "Either he's the guy from Doctor Who, or he's that guy from Morbius, or the Crown, <laughs> or the Crown." I guess, yeah. But it's it's one of those things. It's, he he's not even that much of a big name it just uh -huh. depends on who you ask right. some people go oh doctor who or yeah oh yeah that's the guy from the crown <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah it's the same thing with succession too like the only person who may have been notable is jeremy strong if you've seen the big short or kieran culkin mm. if you know that he's macaulay culkin's brother but right or matthew McFadden if you've seen pride of prejudice but all the other actors they're mainly just like no names so they're able mm. to like just portray this show and hold it on their shoulders so i feel like that's another thing that star wars should do is like i like the notable characters i like recognizable iconography however if that's the only thing we're bringing to the table then i am going to leave didn't didn't one of the episodes of mandalorian have jack black and was it lizzo show up <laughs> or something in an episode and everyone was just completely taken out of it because they're like i'm sorry but i can't buy into these these very recognizable people as just being side characters in star wars do you remember when ed sheeran was in game of thrones he See, was just... that that one i don't actually think it was as bad as fans made it out to be because it was such a short cameo yeah and obviously they had him there to sing and it was kind of obviously he looked out of place because yes. he's such a recognizable name yes but it's one of those things, I don't think it was as egregious as a lot of people said. The scene was decent for humanizing the Lannisters and whatever, okay. like, but yeah, it was weird that they just had Ed Sheeran show up for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do have to say, that cameo with Lizzo and Jack Black was like, okay, so... <laughs> See, yeah, because that's the thing, because I, I wasn't even watching at that yeah. point. I think I either skipped the episode or I didn't watch, like, because what's that? Was that actually Mandalorian or was it, that book about me? I don't even know. Like, <laughs> like, but yeah, it's like they had that. And I just, I remember I heard all about that and I was just like, okay, well, I'm not going to bother watching that one. <laughs> I guess that's what we're doing now. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Because there are benefits to stunt casting. Uh, obviously, to talk about Doctor Who again, that has stunt cast a few times. Mm -hmm. You know, they got Kylie Minogue in for an episode. Right. You know, who's a hugely famous, well-known like actor and musician. Most people in the world know Kylie Minogue. Yeah. Most people probably wouldn't put one and two together and realize that she's that person in Doctor Who. Yeah. Because the character works on her own. You wouldn't think that's Kylie Minogue. And it's um even even Catherine Tate was a bit of a stunt cast at the time because a lot of people were like, why are they putting this comedian in there? She doesn't fit Doc 2. And she's become one of the most well-known famous companions uh, because, you know, Catherine Tate showed that she can do a lot of great drama in there. She she kind of showed a lot of people were underestimating her. And that was a, a good example of stunt casting. And then people like Bradley Walsh and um, uh, John Bishop, mm -hmm. uh, their household names for completely 
like non-acting reasons over here they're comedians or presenters but they got put in the chibnall era and they were the highlight of like like those companion teams mm -hmm. even though you know you wouldn't expect it because most you know john bishop's mainly known for doing stand-up comedy yeah. and bradley walsh presents the chase mm -hmm. that's the thing he's known for you know he's just a game show presenter yeah. um and so there are good examples but then again it depends how famous the person is mm -hmm. and how well they can act as a character because someone like The Rock is always a great example of he's never playing a character. He's playing Dwayne Johnson in every movie. Yeah. Compared to, because obviously, you know, I'm a bit of a lifelong WWE fan. So I, I like to compare each wrestler turned actor. So you get people like Batista, who's a really great actor. Mm -hmm. He, you don't think like, obviously where you're familiar with his work before, you think, okay, that's Batista. But, you know, he was in Dune. He was in Guardians of the Galaxy and right. stuff. And he played these characters as well. You didn't think, oh, that's Batista. You kind of bought into the character well right. same with john cena you know as peacemaker and he's in loads of stuff now he's really well kind of you still have in your head he's like okay that's john cena mm -hmm. but he still kind of plays character well whereas the rock he always plays the rock same with like jason statham yeah. vin diesel they always just play like you don't remember their character names mm -hmm. you just remember them as the actor so it's a, a difficult thing of when you're making a show like house of the dragon you get all these people who are very great actors. They've been in loads of stuff. And, you know, they've probably been in Doctor Who at one point because that's just the way, the way it is with, with British actors. Um, but because I think it was, um, I think, I, I don't know if he's British or Irish, but the guy that played the king for most of House of, House of the Dragon, I'm pretty sure he randomly showed up in like Doctor Who at one point he or did. something. And also, the guy who plays Anthony Bridgerton was in an episode of Doctor Who too. Yeah, like the yes. thing, they always show up. Like, yeah. uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to check. Who was it? Was it it's Paddy something? Uh, he was in something recently that I was like, oh, he was in that. Um, sorry. This, no, you're uh, fine. Because I was actually Paddy... watching Bridgerton with my family, and I was like, oh, he's in Doctor Who. And they were like, who? Okay. Like, the brother. And they're yeah. like, he's a doctor? And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, he <laughs> played a character. He wasn't the doctor. Okay, it was Paddy Constantine. He was in something I watched recently. That I was like, oh, oh, it was okay, yeah, no, so it wasn't Doctor Who, it was Hot Fuzz that I was watching to make a video on, and I was like, huh, that's the guy from House of the Dragon. Oh, <laughs> I can't remember who he played or like what he was in, but it was just one of those weird things of like, again, you, you see someone, you think, oh, okay, I remember that person, but it's not that instant thing. If you, you see something else, you go, oh, okay, that's interesting, right. but you don't see them as the other character, you just recognize the actor, and then you're back into it, right? Exactly, it's just, yeah. Because obviously, yeah, I've seen countless hours of Matt Smith as the Doctor, mm -hmm. and I still bought into him as Damon Targaryen because mm -hmm. he gets into that role so well. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it just shows that, you, yeah, it's a tricky thing of getting actors for their name and actual talent. I think it's a big problem with voice acting specifically, yeah. where they'll get celebrities to voice act rather than actual career voice actors. Mm -hmm. And when they do do like career voice actors, it's always like the same three. You know, if it's a woman, it's Tara Strong. Or whether it's like um it's what who are the other two it's nolan north and um i always forget the other one there's like the two that are like voice actors in every game ever mm -hmm. um and yeah it's if it's not them it's a celebrity and you really get the actual talented voice actors getting these roles because they're and it makes things worse because they're going for these people who don't fit the characters they don't fit the the medium they don't do as well it just doesn't it's like Chris Pratt as Mario is the main example of that. He's like such a terrible part of that movie, you know, because <laughs> he just doesn't work. It just right. doesn't work because yeah. they are, they casted someone for his name uh -huh. as a physical live action actor rather than someone who can actually bring the character to life. Exactly. I mean, in the same movie, you had Jack Black as Bowser. That worked because Jack Black is a good voice actor. Mm -hmm. You know, he's Kung Fu Panda. He has done multiple voice acting projects. Mm -hmm. he is his voice is recognizable but in a way that actually helps the characters and helps his performance. But when you get people like Chris Pratt in, he's just being Chris Pratt pretending to be married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are definitely right. I do remember watching the Mario movie and being like, mm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to lower my expectations just a little bit here. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to get on my nerves. But definitely. <laughs> I feel like in terms of anything Star Wars, I'm literally just leaving that to the side because yeah. 
it, it had it doesn't have the same excitement as it did when they first oh, announced definitely. the Mandalorian and like yeah. Mandalorian season two and then like all these other shows that they rushed out. So yeah, obviously I'm watch. obviously very excited for Andor, but yes. that's it. Anything else I see get announced, I'm just like whatever i'll wait till it comes out and if yeah. it's worth checking out check it out i'm only really occasionally chipping into bad batch whenever just because it's there and i've got friends that like it so occasionally it has good episodes but i won't watch everything i'll just watch like the important ones mm -hmm. just to kind of see how it resolves and especially because it's one of those things you get 90 percent of the way through a show like that you're just like well i may as well just finish it at this point even if i'm not really keen on it so yeah but honestly in my mind, I just wish I wish Nichuti the best of luck, and yeah. I know that with Jodie Whittaker's run on the Doctor, she didn't receive like a warm welcome, whether it's like writing or storylines mm. or because she's not a guy. Like, yeah, and I, I always thought that was unfair because yeah. of obviously you know the even in the universe it was already shown that time loss can become women. It's that's fine. Yeah. It's just I think she was just miswritten, and it's like the worst thing. When you get a big change like that you want them to succeed yeah. because otherwise it just gives people so much ammo and it did because she she was written badly so then people said okay well a female doctor doesn't work mm -hmm. so then obviously if she to get was written badly they'll say okay a black doctor doesn't work and it's yeah. like no that's not what we want to get we want to show like show that they can work mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter whether they're a woman or their skin color or anything like that because you know this is an alien that can change to whatever they they can be a black man or a woman or a black woman or anything like that it's normal it should be fine mm -hmm. this is when they get written badly it just feeds into that idea right. a lot of people have where it doesn't work even though other you know white male doctors were also written badly but it didn't show as like, as obviously mm -hmm. because a lot of it was plastered over by you know the general eras being better or other episodes being written well or the characters being more to what people expected rather than it being a risk that then because the writing is bad they see as a failure whereas it's, it's not that it's not it wasn't jodie whittaker's fault she was given the wrong material i think her doctor was miswritten she wasn't it, she wasn't being allowed to play to her actual strengths as an actor mm -hmm. and you know may, maybe they could have cast a different woman for that kind of doctor they wanted to write for and something like that so it's something with shooty where I, I hope he gets genuine good material i'm already a huge fan of his doctor i i genuinely i see him as the doctor already it's not one of those cases where you're not entirely sold after his first episode i was already on board so I'm excited, yeah. Yeah. In my mind, I feel like this is not, probably not the best thing for me to think about now, but after Nichuti, or like when they were thinking about like recasting casting the new Doctor, I was thinking like, oh, James Acaster, Richard, um, I don't know how to say his last name. I always Richard Ayoade? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Richard Ayoade. Um, and I feel like either one of those people would be good for the next Doctor after Nichuti, because they haven't had a comedian yeah that's the problem i think they shouldn't have a comedian okay because because people were always saying oh richard ayoada would make a great doctor yeah i don't think he would he's obviously he's a great comedian he's a great like comedic actor yeah but there's so much more that goes into being a doctor it's not just about the comedy you've also got to get that serious side mm -hmm. it, and like the the really and if they're always like in that comedian mode it doesn't the stakes don't feel as high it's like uh peter capaldi is a great example of that where you know he made his jokes and stuff but on the majority he was a very serious down to worth like doctor who could make things seem important mm -hmm. whereas if you've got someone who the, yeah the majority of the time they're making those jokes and then they try to be dramatic it won't land as well because mm -hmm. over here there's a, there's a bit of a joke where every time a, an actor playing the doctor leaves there's always two betting odd favorites and it's richard ayoade and chris marshall mm. obviously uh chris marshall uh, was in death in paradise yeah. his most like notable recent role and people a lot of people who are fans are just like that just wouldn't work because they don't have all the elements you need they just have like one or two you need like a lot like uh my personal favorite fan cast is um adrian lester He's been in a few things, uh, namely Hustle over here, which was a, a really good TV show. It came out around the same time as, as Doctor Who came back, kind of the mid 2000s. Um, and yeah, it was just about this group of people who would do, they're like, they were con men, so they would do these like um, these cons on bad people. And there was loads of Doctor Who crossover. Um, 
the you know love and monsters the the main guy from that the the guy he ends up in a relationship with a paving slab um that the blonde guy in that episode david Tennant's era uh-huh. he's in that show uh as one of the main oh. people in their crew and he's really good in that and but yeah adrian lester's kind of like the the lead he's uh he's his character's mickey bricks he's this really suave uh charismatic con man you know mm. he can he can lie to anyone easily but he can also lead a team he's got a lot of doctor elements even in that show alone and i always feel like that's kind of what you want you kind of want to build with the drama and stuff first but then because i think the comedy is easier to come by if if you've got the good writer and you've got someone that can deliver it well as long as you've got the charisma yeah so it's yeah i feel like if you try to go with the comedy first it doesn't work usually you want the comedian to be the companion like we've seen with Catherine tate uh bradley walsh and um John Bishop, usually that's what you want. You want the comedic relief to be a companion rather than the Doctor themselves. Yeah, you're right. I completely forgot about that episode where he ends up with the slug. I actually don't Yeah, know. it's <laughs> it's an otherwise good episode, but that last bit just, uh, oh it God. makes it a real hard one to defend. <laughs> <laughs> Some episodes of Doctor Who are so weird. Like that episode, I think it was Capaldi's first where there's like the lady... And then there's the lizard alien woman. Yeah, like obviously Victoria. they were introduced in the Moffat. Yeah, like uh, series six. Mm, Moffat, um, why did you do that? Funny enough, they're introduced in the episode, I think, that you stopped watching on with the, the baby in space. I think that was the episode yeah. Yeah, those two were. were introduced in. So <laughs> they I might have that, contributed clearly. to that. <laughs> I think that was a little too much for me. I was just like, I... I need a break from this show because y'all are doing a lot right now and I can't suspend my belief anymore. Six, six does a lot all at once. It throws a lot at you. <laughs> You're not ready. <laughs> okay. I feel like we have talked a lot about Doctor Who and Star Wars. Um, we've caught, we've kept off so many different things and I feel like we've covered a lot. Um, so I just wanted to end off with like some recommendations. If there yep. are any like shows or movies you've seen recently that you want to recommend to the listeners. Um, I would recommend uh, in side number nine that's the show yeah right? yes yeah because i have i think i did watch like an episode or two when i was interested in black mirror because mm. i used to be like obsessed with black mirror and yeah someone recommended that show to me because they said it was similar to it and i was like oh cool so i do want to go back and like watch that show again yeah i think that black mirror is coming back for another season but i'm not going to be watching that because mm. i'm done with that yeah show. i wasn't too keen on the last season of black no, mirror i like the I liked Beyond the Sea, the the space station one. That was okay until kind of the end where it spiraled out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, Lock Henry was decent that episode, but yeah, most of the last season of Black Mirror was just kind of bleh, yeah. in my opinion. So I'm not too fussed on that anymore. It felt but yeah, a definitely too, like meta almost. Yeah, it kind of felt like they were trying too hard yes. to do everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of recommendations, definitely Inside Number Nine because that it it has the same anthology approach um it kind of spans multiple different genres you know there are very comedic episodes that have quite slapstick comedy there are episodes that are just done in iambic pentameter like a shakespeare play there are episodes that are very very scary horror ones very unsettling ones they, they just mix genres and they get meta with it and the the writers appear in almost every episode as different characters mm -hmm. and they, they just effortlessly become these different roles and sometimes you don't even realize that oh yeah that's one of the writers that's just because they're yeah they're writers and uh, actors mm -hmm. so that's a really good show and it, it messes around with a lot of the conventions you'd expect like um there, there was one episode they advertised a lot and then they actually aired it and it seemed like it was like a game show when it aired live so everyone was like oh i guess it's not airing but then it turned out that was actually the episode uh -huh. And they just did this whole game show with like the like a twist at the end, and it was just really well done. And obviously, unfortunately, it doesn't work as well on like playback, like catch up mm -hmm. when you go in knowing. It. But obviously, where it was advertised to be airing on BBC at the time, people expected one thing, got something very different, mm -hmm. and it worked really well for how they did that. So, Inside Number Nine is a very great. It's almost over actually. They're releasing the ninth and last ser uh, series this uh, May actually. I think it is. Because they, yeah, they, the whole thing is about nines, you know, everything takes place within like a room number nine or like a house number nine or mm -hmm. something like that. 
and then so naturally i guess they've just wanted to do nine series and yeah. that's the fitting number to end it with so yeah you can jump in and watch any of those episodes randomly because none of them connect to each other mm -hmm. so that's really good um in terms of other recommendations obviously fallout uh it's a new show that's come out really good especially if you're a fan of the games uh i think it's even if you're not i think it's a really accessible show like you know my parents don't really know anything about fallout and they enjoy it so it's just a very open show for anyone to kind of get into um june 2 i watched recently great movie uh in terms of, i don't really watch too much stuff that's like coming out at the moment yeah. i tend to just we watch the same stuff all the time or usually i just have youtube on in the background i don't find much time to watch many things um yeah it's always a tricky one when people are like oh what a recommendation i'm just like i've just forgotten everything i've ever watched in like the last 10 years yeah you know? <laughs> i tend to do that as well even though like i'm the host of this podcast even when i say like so if you have any recommendations and in my head i'm like do you and i was like <laughs> <laughs> i didn't ask myself that question i asked them <laughs> i'm trying to think of mine um, yeah it's the only so thing tricky. i can think of is like monkey man because i've I heard just, good things about that you, it's a very good movie i do have to say um it's it does feel very john wick which a lot right. of people have compared it to, and I would say that's mm. an inaccurate comparison. As someone who is a fan of John Wick movies, I think it's really solid. And there is like some like political commentary in it, but I think yeah. you can handle it pretty well. Some of it does go like a little bit murky, but mm. for me, it's only murky because like I happen to understand like what it's referencing, and I think that the movie is kind of hinging on american audiences not really knowing anything about indian politics yeah you know because originally it was a little more heavy-handed and it was supposed to be on netflix but netflix mm. decided not to distribute the film because they didn't want to like upset their indian investors so right. they went for the full release in theaters i don't know where it's going to go on streaming but it's not it's probably not going to go on netflix but mm. it is a really good movie and def patel as a first-time director has done a really great job of creating the story and i think that people really like it and also i'm excited to watch fallout because another yeah. thing that's great about adaptations is when you don't have to know the original source material to enjoy it you can yeah. just enjoy the show and that's definitely with fallout it's like obviously yeah if you don't know anything it's gives you everything you need to know it's very contextual uh it's also funny watching it with someone that doesn't know like kind of the deeper secrets about the like the vaults mm -hmm. or like the brothers of steel and stuff and watching them watch it and you're just thinking that and they're like oh this is interesting whatever and they don't know like they, they don't know the deep lore yes. which obviously will eventually become part of the show because it kind of has to be right. because it's so intrinsically tied within the world but yeah it's it's interesting watching stuff as a fan next to a non-fan and you both enjoy it just as much mm -hmm. because for the fans there's always little touches and easter eggs like oh you know it's a little the bobblehead things in the background or like the stim packs are the exact same as they are in the games and all and there's like yeah little references like i mentioned earlier about getting sidetracked mm -hmm. and then yeah it's just a solid show all around uh, another thing i just remembered to recommend is uh, what we do in the shadows a yes. uh, great sitcom um kind of like it's a weird one because it's kind of like cross America and UK because yeah. it, it got it got pushed over here on a uh, BBC, so it's obviously a big UK and obviously Matt Berry yes. is one that and uh, yeah, so it's it's a very big cross national hit and it work I think it perfectly bridges the gap between American humor and British humor because right. they're very as you see like you mentioned stuff like uh, The Office, mm -hmm. like when you have two versions of the same show. They're very different because Americans laugh at stuff British people don't laugh at, and British people laugh at stuff Americans could never laugh at, yeah. and stuff. We're, we're very different senses of humor. But what we do in the shadows manages to get that perfectly in the middle. You know, it has a lot of the American like style of jokes, but also a lot of the British style of jokes. But it never makes you feel like you can't understand one. You understand both, and they both work. So that's, I think, another good recommendation. Yeah, I love what we do in the shadows mainly because like i loved the film and to see the show come out i was kind of like nervous because yeah they do tend to do that sometimes where it's like oh this is a good movie let's make a show out of it but the show is actually a really great extension of yeah. the film itself and i'm sad that it's ending but i'm happy oh, ending? That's the thing. I, I didn't actually know it's, I, I think i've got a lot to catch up on but <laughs> at least i'm prepared now for when i do 
to savor it. Yeah, the newest season is going to be the last one. And I think they just wrapped filming possibly this month or it was last month. Right. So, yeah. Okay, it's, well, it's I'll, I'll prepare for that then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, What We Do in the Shadows is an awesome show. And I would recommend to everyone as well. And I would also recommend everyone to go check out uh, Harvey's channel. Which will be Thank linked you. in the description down below. Um, Harvey, uh, is there any other place where people can find you besides your um, YouTube channel, Harbo Wolms? Yep, that's correct. Harbo Wolms. <laughs> people always say Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I don't really have, like, I guess I sometimes post on Twitter mainly just to post my videos when they go up, but sometimes I'll tweet on, on there. Um, I do have a second channel, Harbo clips harbo 2 i can't remember what it's exactly called it's called something and then the thumbnail is something different so i, don't know. I think it's harbo 2 uh i don't really put post much on there but it's worth checking out maybe for when i do uh, i do have a discord server but apart from that it's not really anything i tend to just post on youtube so okay well you know what guys all this stuff will be in the description down below thank you so much for joining me this is really awesome i had a really great thank time you. Okay, so um, guys, don't forget to check out Harvey. All the stuff will be in the description. Don't forget to check us out on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and on Patreon as well. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. The audio version is up every Saturday. The YouTube version is up every Monday. And my name is Monica. I am your host. Um, don't forget to tell all your friends and family about your new favorite podcast. I have a meaning to watch that. And we will see you guys next week with a new topic and a new guest like we do every single week. Bye. Bye.